The chapter starts with Alita's flashback, when the six emperors decided to kill off all the blood relations of the tyrant king, but a bodyguard, Karen, was trusted by the king's wife to keep their daughter alive and safe. He took that as his responsibility and took the daughter to Defilon Mountain and caring and loving her like a father. Being a free hirer, he was the one who taught her how to fight like a sword hire. He raised her the best way possible while keeping her identity secret and his job intact. Now they both live in the hiding only going out for commission money. Sihan suddenly gets cautious of whether she considers him an enemy as he has been the person who killed her father, but she responds in an unbothered way of not having any connection with his troubled father anymore. She further explained the reason for attacking him being the fact that the emperors are scared of the king's family opening portals and summoning otherworldly creatures, so to tackle that, they decided to find all the king's blood relatives and execute them. So when Sihan asked her about her relation to King Lusklin, she mistook him for one of the executors. This behavior of his former of friends frustrates him to no end, but being an Earth's typical creature, he goes on to casually and confidently console Alita and tell her how he, a suddenly dropped guy in her life, is a good person as compared to those people. Alita, obviously unimpressed, cuts him off asking if he is the savior Sung Sihan, because to her knowledge he went back to Earth. So how come he fell from the sky and that too naked? The naked part triggers Sihan and he embarrassedly starts ranting about how he isn't a weird guy who was naked by choice. But the portals only let living organisms pass and it kills him to fall naked the third time. He goes on to whine about falling back to earth naked in the midst of a big crowd. Confused yet ignoring his rant, she further inquires why would anybody in Terranor open a portal to summon him back, and who could have that power? To this Sihan arrogantly tells that he opened the portal and summoned himself back and it took him a good 10 years to do so, but he cuts himself off becoming hyper-aware suddenly, Alita questions baffled. Sihan explains how to open the portals, he used directions towards the bloodline of Lusklin, which indirectly makes her his summoner since she's the purest of Lusklin blood, but the worst part is that to the others, it'll surely seem that she summoned him for her revenge. Alita is shocked and confused over this. All this speech leads to the fact that the guards under Higher Zeon and Magion clan have already arrived, at the location where traces of summoning magic are found and are ready to attack her cabin. Zeon thanks clan for his aid in finding traces of summoning magic while Alita gets herself together to fight those people. Sihan, looking like dumb trouble, stands there thinking how Alita looks so ready to face such a situation, and how she might hate him for blowing her cover that she kept intact for years. His dramatic self even imagines her lashing out at him for this. So Sihan, nervously, asks Alita to say something if she wants to, and to his surprise, she ends up thanking him for warning her timely of this sudden attack. Zeon warns Alita, the sinner in his perspective, to surrender herself or she'll be blown up along with her cabin. He asks Clan to scare her with a small attack to which Clan calmly fires up the cabin with a burning spear. A panicked Zeon starts screaming how this was way out of line to which Calm Clan explains how this is only a show fire, and it won't hurt her other than a slight chance of a few burns. A sudden burst cuts them off as Alita is out of the cabin without a single scratch to her. This shocks everyone out there but they try and fight her in the greed of the 10 gold coin reward Zeon announced for capturing her alive. What shocks everyone, even more, is the fact that she's a sword higher, strong enough to take down many of those soldiers. Alita fights the soldiers while thinking of a way to get out when a strike blows her off to the ground. An angry Zeon, surrounded by blue light, announces that he will now deal with the cursed lowly blood himself. Alita notices the fighting energy on his armor, the reason that took her down. She worries about him being a level higher than her. She still takes a chance to try and fight him but ends up with a broken arm. Knowing she had no choice but to surrender, she puts down her weapons. Zeon, confused, proceeds to tell her she made the right choice when someone cuts him off by suddenly speaking from very near his ear. Sihan appears out of nowhere babbling about how Zeon was feeling bad for Alita so he lost all his anger, and is now getting calm with her. Meanwhile, Zeon stands there extremely baffled over the identity of this unknown personality and the fact that he didn't feel even the slightest of his movements around him. Zeon tries to interrogate who Sihan is and how are his movements so smooth when Sihan calmly says he has got to take some responsibility, even though he got nothing against him the next moment Zeon is seen flying away with force enough to bury him half in the ground just by a casual punch of Sihan, leaving every person too stunned for a moment. 
Alida sits on the ground confused why Sihan is hurting the soldiers that work under the kings that were his allies. Clan angrily exclaims he must be of the evil bloodline too and orders the soldiers to take him down but Sihan, calmly and arrogantly, keeps sending them flying off and a half into the ground along with a slick and no hard feelings, and an explanation that he is not of the evil bloodline. Too scared to die that way. The rest of the soldiers start apologizing to Sihan while Zeon gains consciousness and is about to get up to fight back only to be shocked, seeing his soldiers lying around him, buried in the ground the same way as Hum. Zeon looks at them ashamed and confused about how an unarmed human was able to do that so casually, and how he is lucky he is still alive when his mind suddenly clicks about seeing such strength and movements before too. He recalls seeing Savior Sihan do it in the past. But before he could be clear, Sahan approaches the now awake Zeon, who is too shocked and scared to react, asking him to rest a little longer and punches his half into the ground like an ostrich once again. Along with burying living people to the ground with bare movement, Sihan keeps repeating how he has nothing against them so they don't need to fight, but if they try, they'll be taken down. Magion clan disappointedly thinks about the soldiers being useless and wonders who this sword hire monster is and where he appears. Sihan turns to a disoriented Alita and inquires if she's not gonna get up since he doesn't think they're gonna attack them anymore. Still blank and bewildered regarding the whole scenario, she complies and gets up to start waking away with Sihan. Clan angrily exclaims about the failure of the mission and that they should retreat since higher Zeon is down. He asks the remaining soldiers to take care of the dead ones when one of them hesitantly responds that all the soldiers are alive, they just have been buried in the ground with that force. This comes as a major shock to clan on how they are all fine, with not a single broken bone, and alive even after being hit this badly, the guy didn't even cause a single death. The last and most obvious sentence is, what the hell just happened? Sihan and Alita walk far enough in the forest where Sihan consoles an injured, tiredly walking Alita that they won't be followed from there now. He thinks to himself how it's a relief that they didn't follow him, since it would've been annoying for him. He also wonders if the side effects of crossing dimensions were stronger than he anticipated, since his powers seem to be only a tenth of the original and his mana powers don't even seem to be there compared to when he took down the king back then. He thinks of how long it'll be till these side effects wear off. He is brought out of his thoughts by a wincing Alita, whom he inquires of being okay, since her arm had been broken. She gratefully responds how it could've been worse so she's lucky and it's all good. Sihan looks at her funnily, thinking how is that something to be thankful for, while she puts her arm in a sling around her neck for support. She further thanks Sihan formally, in a mood to be pleasant and in sync with the scenario that just unfolded in front of her, and says she'll be on her own now. Sihan just stands there too stunned to react for a moment and then starts exclaiming how and where she would be on her own with a broken arm, and a risk of life. She calmly responds that she can be extra cautious to which Hyper Sihan exclaims how it's far more dangerous, and then sighs to calmly explain to her that it's his fault she got into this mess and got injured so he'll help her. Alita processes this and after a solid moment of consideration agrees to it. Sihan wonders why she even took that long to consider this and tells her to drop formalities with him, and asks where she planned on going since she can't stay here. They consider places but aware of the fact that there will be search parties, decide to go to Kagan City for the while. The Lilstein Kingdom Palace shows its first king, Lilstein I, calmly reading his books in a palace that looked more like a library due to the amount of bookshelves aligned there when a scared servant, hesitantly brings him the news from the search party that went to Defilon Mountain, where Alita's cabin was. The king, one of his former partners Sihan, closes his book and inquires about what the news is. Lilstein rushes down towards the dungeon of his palace and the gates open to reveal a space full of books with a huge capsule in the center, filled with some red chemical that looks very much like blood. Lilstein's name is called he gets him to move towards a cell where a chained guy with multiple wounds curses at him. The guy has a green circle beneath him. Lilstein demeaningly talks to the guy about being well enough in terms he wants and calls him the descendant of Lusklin. He further reveals that the red circle beneath him turned green because his mana powers have matured enough now. This angers the guy who curses more at Lilstein and pities the people who worship him. Lilstein nonchalantly mocks the guy about him being the real pitiful person for his heart is about to get snatched right out of his chest now. This jolts the guy but before he could completely process this, 
Lilstein quite literally grabs his heart out of his chest in a monstrous way, as if he was not dealing with a human at all. He looks at the mana he snatched out of the guy's heart but realizes that this is not sufficient enough to break the walls of the dimensions, because the guy was some low-grade, far-off relative of the bloodline of Lusklin, and he'd need a much pure blood to gather enough mana to break the walls of dimensions of other worlds. This reveals the true intention of Lilstein for capturing the descendants of Luskin alive rather than directly executing them. Lilstein suddenly recalls the conversation he had with his servant who filled him in about the failure of his men's mission, at Defilon Mountain. He was told that all their men were brutally beaten up by a single man who did not even have any arms on him, so they could not capture their target. Lilstein further explained the appearance of the person being black hair and black eyes, similar to the Gallen race of Kagan village. Lilstein thinks about the appearance along with the fact that traces of summoning magic were found there. This made him fear the possibility that Sihan was back in Terranor. Even though, a worried Lilstein then shrugged this thought off considering there was no way Sihan crossed dimensions again without his notice, his paranoid expressions were not unnoticeable, while he kept repeating there's no way this happened. Sihan is amazed by the looks of Kagan City and nostalgically explains to Alita how he knows this place as South Clanium City back from the king's rule and he used to have his main base here. Alita is surprised by the information of the main base, to which Sahan further explains how it's easier to hide in this place, since there's this race called Galen Race that looks very similar to his South Asians. Alita is again baffled by the term South Asians when he further explains that it's his people back on Earth. Alita is completely taken aback by this knowledge of people looking like him as it connects to the rumored Thousand Change Energy of the Thief Queen Lavina. Thousand Change Energy has been a technique where one uses its fighting energy to control the air around their face to make it look different in others' sights. Alita further refers to it as a technique of Thief Queen Lavina along with her stealth technique. Sihan gets pretty offended at that and tells how it was him who developed this technique and taught it to Lavina. He then offers Alita if she wants to learn the technique from him since it'd make it easier for her to hide. But she declines receiving such big help from Sahan with which Sahan sighs that they still aren't getting any closer, and tells her to drop that topic then and look for an accommodation. Alita thinks to herself how she finds Sihan's face quite funny looking to accept the offer of learning to do that. Sihan finds a stay in hotel and looks at it with quite a familiarity, not because he knew the hotel but because there used to be the gallows ten years ago. Alita gets pretty frightened at the possibility of hotel being haunted to which Sihan seems amused that he could meet many familiar faces as ghosts. Sihan proceeds to get a key for their room but hears the old receptionist man irritatedly blabbering which makes Sihan realize he has been speaking informally to strangers and elders ever since he came back to Terranor. Alita further embarrasses him with the fact that even if he's a legendary hero and she doesn't care, that man was pretty old so he got offended by that. He starts getting self-conscious about how it's so bad that he has been doing it without realizing since he didn't have to talk formally to many people in Aston language from back then. He then chuckles nervously that he has been rude to a stranger girl unknowingly but she indifferently responds that he can keep speaking casually now. Getting to a more serious conversation, Alita questions why he came to this place to which Sahan says the first thing he wants to do is adjust to the place by traveling around with her for a while if she allows. Alita finds this question a bit too blunt but composes herself and explains how she doesn't think it's a good idea for him, since they could get caught because of her. She also questions a now stunned Sihan on the fact that she'll be questioning herself for the reason the whole time, if he just travels with her the whole time with no proper explanation. A tortured Sihan reluctantly reveals to Alita that she'd easily get caught without him, since every time someone summons an otherworldly creature, the dimensions here shake but since he did so himself using her. It only vibrates the dimensions a bit so they'd be leaving traces wherever they go. Alita questions this in extreme distress and panic, but Sihan calms her down that he has covered the traces via his magic. But since the spell needs to be recasted every two days so that's why he has been asking her to accompany him. Alita now starting to relax and process this distractedly accepts that she definitely needs him, but also puts out a much important question, but why does Sihan need her? Higher Zeon is seen to be expressing his embarrassment at his failure to his hire in Darwin and Delstre, capital of Lustenad Kingdom. He requests another chance from his hire to capture their target that slipped away last time but the hire responds that probation is better than failing again with those useless untrained troops because the king didn't even bother trying to punish them. 
This shocked Xion as he failed to comply with the king's orders, and yet they were all forgiven, nevertheless. He keeps determined to try again to capture the two sword hires he encountered that day. This infuriates in Darwin and he mocks Xion to go ahead and reclaim the honor he is talking about losing. Xion walks down the halls thinking with surety that they went to Kagan City due to the direction they went in so he wonders the possible place they could go to while job hunting. Since they need money to survive he is only one place where a free hire request for work. His aim hasn't been catching the Luskan blood but to make sure by himself whether the other guy was Sung Sahan or not and that confusion is what's been driving him to what he mentioned as restoring his honor. A servant introduces Alida and Sihan as Alida and Sean to Lord while the two awkwardly discuss in the background why Sihan went with the name Sean so if Alida accidentally refers to him as Sihan it won't cause an issue. The two awkwardly stand there while the servant explains how the two are fighters or warriors ranked sword higher. The six ranks of sword hires are explained as Seed rank, they can only use fighting energy to enhance their physical capabilities. Warrior rank, they can inculcate their fighting energy into their metal weapons. Knight rank, the higher who can diffuse their fighting energy in the armor they are wearing as well. Master rank, those who can instill their fighting energy in non-metal weapons as well. Transcendent ranked are those who can imbue their fighting energy in thin air to create a blade-like weapon effect of it. A deity rank sword higher is the most superior rank which only a few have ever been able to achieve. They are the true masters of everything possible with fighting energy. Savior Sung Sihan was one of them. But all his fighting and magic energy had been used up in his dimensional travel. Sihan thinks of his rank being so lower in a tortured and embarrassed way. But Lord Ted seems to think otherwise, he is amazed that they have a fighter rank at this young age and welcomes them. They are told to rest until tomorrow when the subjugation squad leaves. In his room, Sihan sighs and drops himself to his bed, talking in exasperation about how it's tiring to earn money and that if it was back in time, he would have just stolen from some noble's house. Alida is surprised by this and questions why the legend used to steal. He tiredly responds that his girlfriend used to be a thief but they had a sense of righteousness to it, and they only used to steal from bad nobles. Alida thinks dumbfounded how this would have been a dangerous love story between creatures of two different worlds. Sihan continues to mock ironically how stealing would be hard now so. Yeah, they should go for some killing and blood splattering for righteous earning. Anita boringly says this could sound wrong to anyone else hearing it. Sihan, now focused, questions whether the request was for controlling some monster. Alida briefs him on how a pack of igneous wolves has been found in the Barcelon territory but the last subjugation squad failed due to lacking numbers which is why they are hiring sword hires now to deal with this matter. Sihan calmly replies that 13 years ago, his first experience was with these fire-spitting wolves as they were trying to get rid of them from the woods. He then gets memories of them praising him and calling themselves a team which frustrates him. Sihan sits up, much more serious than before, and speaks that this would help him as a warm-up since he's already lost a lot of power. Alida is baffled at this and questions how is he saying that when he beat her using just a spoon and took care of the search party nights, pretty easily too. Arrogant savior Sihan gets offended at this and exclaims how it's a lot of weakness that he had to even use a spoon to beat her. Alida thinks that his way of saying that is pretty infuriating. Then Alida just confusedly listens to a Sihan, who definitely was assuring himself that even if his powers are less he still owns a lot of experience and he has been some champion in his world too which again is an entirely foreign term to Alida so Sihan shrugs it off and sends her off to sleep. In the morning, Knight Ted shows an exaggerated enthusiasm to win this time while other soldiers just question the heavy armor that might not be beneficial in this fight. On the move, Sahan inquires about Alita about her arm who thanks him for using his energy to heal her arm. He and some other soldiers then vet alarmed over the smell of sulfur around them and see the red monstrous igneous wolves with fiery eyes and mouths dangerously advancing towards them. Ted overconfidently moves ahead and throws belittling remarks at the wolves, but he is taken down before he could even have the first strike. Sihan mocks how his armor caused him to get thrown by an attack he could have defended. Ted shouts back that a knight is supposed to fight with his armor. Others try and keep fighting, a little more confident with the backup of sword higher this time. Sihan finds fighting these wolves too easy for him and he knows he can take them all, but he decides against it to avoid attention, until everyone's shock and exclamations make him turn and face the leader of the pack. 
And of course, this brings an evil, interested grin to Sihan's face. All the soldiers start running like cowards seeing the leader Ignea and even Ted just puts the burden on Alita and Sihan, and runs off towards his soldiers to which Sihan reacts unamused. He then casually laughs at how they are supposed to take all the dangerous work in this job as if those two are not just facing a pack of fire-spitting wolves. Alita listens to him calmly till he asks her to face the leader while he finished up with the rest of the pack to which Alita is taken aback and shocked but she tries to compose herself and nervously goes with it. The leader spits his fire filled with his fighting energy but Alita does not cower away and smoothly attacks the leader in the face. Sihan is impressed by her but his praise and confidence in her are cut short when they both are stunned to see Alita's sword, broken by that attack on the wolf's face. The leader wildly attacks Alita and grabs her with himself. Sihan is horrified at this and runs to her rescue. Sihan was not summoned by Lusklin's sacrifice like the last time but by linking with a summoner that is Lusklin blood, which is the reason why Sihan wants Alita's company to protect her because if she dies, he'll be thrown back to earth. A panic Sihan tries to catch up to save a pained Alita with the wilf, but he has a hard time doing so with his low fighting energy, and his energy that changes his resemblance. Sihan panics about how he spent 10 years to be back here and prepared himself to fall into the sky nude, which he finds important as compared to someone's life, so he is not ready to go back to this type of humiliation. This pumps him enough to gather enough energy to exhibit dragon sword energy. Even though the wolf is stunned when a powerful serious Sihan catches up to him, Sihan does not have a hard time ending the leader wolf. Sihan lies around exhausted around an unconscious Alita thinking how taking it all casually almost cost him his entire migration, to Terranor. Night falls by the time Alita gets conscious and upon being questioned about her health by Sihan, she tells she's just sore because the wolf didn't seem to intend on killing her. However, Alita then gets embarrassed by almost being a wolf's meal. Alita ponders over something for a moment and then decides to question Sihan, considering then allies, about why he has been hiding his identity when the six kingdoms are ruled by his six friends, and he technically would be treated as a royal guest here. Sihan responds with a laugh at the last statement, but then gets serious about the explanation of the betrayal he faced. He goes on to tell Alita how they threw him back with return magic right away without an ounce of hesitation, as if they had this plan together all along. He reminisces the painful memory and explains how it still feels fresh in his head yet he doesn't understand why they do that to him, and how could he not judge any of their true intentions. After an eerie silence, Sihan looks at Alita and wonders, confused why she is not giving a shocked reaction or any reaction at all to getting involved, in a war with all six kingdoms. Suddenly Alita concludes that he came seeking revenge so it's understandable why he's been hiding his identity. Sihan just looks at her bewildered for a moment and then exclaims why is she so calm about the fact that they'd be going against all kingdoms. Alita, calm as ever, replies that she has been in a war for 10 years with all the Terranor due to her identity, so if she's involved in this, she will make the best out of it. Sihan, dumbfounded, just tells her she is hopelessly positive, to which she happily laughs and says she receives the same compliment from her dad. But of course, she has to clear to Dent Sihan that she's talking about Karen and not the tyrant monster. Sihan suddenly gets alarmed and warns Alita that someone is approaching them. Alita and Sihan get cautious of someone heading towards them wondering if it's an enemy which Sihan deems impossible this early, however, and they both stay alert for whoever it is. The person sees people and starts asking for help for directions from them unaware of the shocked faces of Alita and Sean. It was the search team's leader hire Zeon lost in the forest. Zeon mimics their expressions when he realizes who he is facing but before he could say anything Alita attacks him he barely escapes and hurriedly says he's not intending to fight them. Zeon panics again when Sihan appears behind him out of nowhere telling him he might be honest but he gotta take him out again just in caution. Only this time, to Sihan's utter shock, Zeon breaks free from Sihan's attack. Sihan questions Zeon about how he knew to release from a skill that only Sihan mastered in from a young age, and even his friends didn't know how to release from it. Zeon starts shuffling through his bag with determination when Sihan gets alert and mad about what he's planning on getting out but he is left speechless midway by what Zeon presents to him through both his hands underwear. Sihan's face loses all color at that and after a solid moment of judgment from both Sihan and Alita when Zeon asks Sihan if it belongs to him. Sihan looks coldly at a childishly smiling Zeon and asks Alita to kill the perv chillingly. 
Xion, frightened, tries to explain that he didn't intend that to come out this way but it was his nervousness that made him sound like a pervert. Sihan remains unbothered and offended wanting him to die when Xion, already looking like his soul left his body, shouts nervously that he surrenders. Xion questions him waving underwear instead of a white flag, still wanting Alita to kill him. But then Sihan's face pales as he notices his name on the boxers and that too in Korean, his native language. Xion calms at this and he excitedly announces that he knew it was the savior Sung Sihan. Sihan remembers his thousands transformation wasn't cast so he questions Xion whether he remembers his face. Xion shyly introduces himself as someone Sihan saved 12 years ago in Varan village. This catches Sihan's attention as he doesn't seem to recall what Xion has been mentioning. Xion explains he was young back when Sihan defeated all the imperial soldiers invading their villages with this same skill, and Xion later found out it was the otherworldly savior who saved them all. Xion's eyes start getting big and shiny like a kid as he admiringly recalls how after a being a sword higher he realized how this powerful skill was learned by his sir Sihan, who did not intend to kill the opponent even if it's his enemy. Sihan nervously chuckles thinking how that attack was only him testing his skill but the impact turned out to be much better than his intention. Sihan suddenly questions that if Xion is so much younger why doesn't he look like it to which Xion brightly throws a cheesy phrase that one's appearance is only a shell, it's what's inside that actually matters. Sihan cringes as that asking where in world did he learn that from to which he gets to know those were his own words back then, embarrassing him to no end. Sihan then asks him he's got to stop waving the underwear in their faces now, and moving around with that even if he looks up to him sounds a bit extreme. But does that affect Xion? No. Instead, he gets even more excited talking about he literally has everything related to Sung Sihan with him, from mini statues, stuffed toys to stories about him. Sihan couldn't get more uncomfortable with that knowledge. Only he does get more uncomfortable when Xion explains that this underwear is most special since it was wore by Sihan, when he defeated the tyrant. Xion then gets serious, bowing down to Sihan wanting to become his blade explaining he only w 9 ked for King Rilstein, because he was once Sihan's companion. Sihan considers for a moment then questions what if he is against Rilstein now, to which Xion, without any hesitation replies he'll still support Sihan. Seeing the determination in the eyes of Xion, Sihan decides to believe him and take him in his alliance by accepting his sword. Xion proudly stands up that he'd give his best and won't let him down. He also offers to take down the rest of the Igneous wolves to which Sihan and Alita, who has been invisible since then, look at him baffled that it's already been taken care of, as you saw the body of the leader wolf. Xion, confused himself, questions didn't they put it out to lure the female leader as wolves always travel with their mates. Alita and Sihan realize indeed their minds missed this detail about wolves and to perfectly time with this realization, the female leader graces the three with her might presence. Lady leader growls at them, burning red with anger while Sihan nervously wonders how he managed to forget such an obvious detail while their hunt. Alita adds fuel to the fire by mentioning that even a legend can overlook such details to which an offended Sihan tries to explain that it's been a long time since he's fought them. A determined Xeon intervenes asking his sir Sihan to let him handle the lady wolf alone to show him his skills. Sihan, unimpressed, tells him to go ahead. Xeon prepares himself to impress Sihan as he recalls his embarrassing first impression by being struck and buried to ground twice. He gets ready to aim and imbues his fighting energy determined to catch Sihan's eye but that only impresses Alita and Sihan. On the other hand stands there bored on why is he being so dramatic. The wolf growls and Xeon also screams and they both entangle in a powerful fight. And Xeon actually has an upper hand against the giant angry wolf. Alita stands there amazed by Xeon's talent and how he is the one leading in fight steadfastly. She now surely thinks he went easy on her back when he attacked her. Sihan also stares thoughtfully and replies to Alita that she's pretty strong for her age, but this guy is pretty amazing. Alita sounds half offended on behalf of Xeon as she thinks he is a genius and not just a pretty, amazing to which Sihan nervously chuckles that the people he saw back then were actual geniuses so he thought of it as pretty talented. He furthers clarifies that he himself is not a genius and just is special due to him being from another world. He impressively calls Lavina a real genius which baffles Alita. 
Xeon keeps fighting and even successfully lasses through the flame the wolf kept spitting, but as soon as he went on to strike the wold, the same way as Alita, the lightning magic strike throws him off in an embarrassing way. This embarrasses Alita even more since she now saw in third person how pitiful her defeat was against the male wolf earlier. Even Xeon gets up embarrassed and confused on how an Ignis wolf is using lightning attacks now. Trying to restore her embarrassment, Alita takes a step forward trying to end this now but Sihan cuts her off that he'll deal with her if she's escorted to using magic. That's when a bulb of realization lights up in Alita's head and she figures out that magic does not work on Sihan. She realized that back then too the monster army was feared because magic didn't work on creatures from other worlds. And even the strongest Magians fall short in front of the otherworldly creatures. Sihan moves swiftly through the flame of the wolf, arrogantly saying that won't work on him and it's this fact that helped him survive for so long back then too. He dramatically builds that he only pretended to dodge back around people, but now he doesn't have to but before he got get more arrogant about it, he actually is struck off just as pathetically as the earlier two by the magic. Alita looks at him bored and disappointed while Xeon has his jaw hanging. Alita mocks him of this being another deja vu while Sihan lies there shocked and embarrassed on how magic worked against him, as it has never happened before. The embarrassment offends Sihan so much that he finishes off the fight in one strike. Xeon worriedly asks if he's okay, to which Sihan just tells him to cut out the formality of using it sir with his name. Suddenly the wolf's body start disintegrating into blue fragments of the magic energy, which confuses the three on what happened. The next morning, Lord Ted happily exclaims that it's a relief they are alive and the beasts have disappeared thanks to them and rewards them, with 600 silver coins. They both walk out when Sihan talks that this won't be enough for them, but it's a good reward for one job. He then childishly exclaims that they should take up multiple tasks and clear them together to earn money collectively. Aboard Alita tells him it was just luck that they got this one work right away else it's not easy for work to appear. Sihan dejectedly agrees with her. Xeon comes back asking them if they are done with in questions that he said they needed money so offers them a bag of 100 gold coins. Sihan and Alita are left dumbfounded by that and ask where did he manage to get this much money. That seems to add salt to some wound of Xeon since he painfully and on the verge of tears reveals that he sold the other world's relic. In easier words, he sold Sihan's underwear that was so dear to him. Sihan looks at him with dread and wonders why he even bothered to ask that question while Xeon just consoles himself, that it was to help his mighty Sihan. Alita also looks at Sihan with interest that his underwear sure turned out to be expensive, which makes Sihan even more uncomfortable than before. Xeon then questions what their plans are since they now have enough money. Sihan looks at the bag of gold coins and thinks where to go out of the three countries they could go to from Kagan City. He thinks of going for the weakest guy first when he sees a face on one of the coins and mock laughs at the fact that he never thought he'd see one of his friend's face again on a coin. He then announces that his decision is to head towards the Jexengord Kingdom first. In Lilstein Kingdom Palace, a globe shines in the basement lab of King Lilstein on which Magion Tranden calls for the attention of King Lilstein. Lilstein questions what this is in reference to which Tranden reluctantly explains they don't need to hire anyone to run tests. On their subjects 11 and 12, which turn out to be the two leader wolves that Sihan executed. But Lilstein and Tranden don't ponder over it much provided those two subjects weren't very strong monsters of theirs. Tranden then adds even more nervously that they've lost test subject number one. This does not go calmly for Lilstein and he goes berserk with anger on how can he be so careless when he is the head of the Blue Ivory Tower. Blue Ivory Tower is one of the four Magion Towers, red, white, blue and black, that have existed in Terranor since ages. The first Lilstein King was the strongest Magion to ever exist who gathered all the magic knowledge of Terranor, and divided it into four towers to keep a record of it all. The skills and levels of magic have been divided into different floors of the towers. Lilstein has been the floor 9 skilled Magion of the Red Ivory Tower hence why all his magic energy highlights the color red. Lilstein keeps insulting Tranden on how he isn't even qualified to be a tour leader. He only reached that point because people with more skills than him were executed. He gravely warns Tranden of a last chance to deal with subject 1 in first priority. A scared, stammering Tranden responds in affirmative glad that at least he got one last chance. 
An old servant, squire, enters the room of the first king of Jexengord Kingdom, Jexengord Rottenburg, in his capital Rattenzel. The servant mentions a happy Jexengord who actually has all his reasons to be happy as he's sipping his wine with multiple fine women, surrounding his bare chest. Squire worriedly Kirstjens if his lord had a party again, to which Jexengord gets even more excited that he could not be happier with this lifestyle. Squire gets even tenser telling him that he's been avoiding his political duties as a king and people might start bashing him, if he's not working for them. But does that affect Jexengord, not the slightest. He casually leans back sipping from his wine and questioning how this would be extravagance and overspending, if he's spending his own money. Squire looks at him with a dark blank look that the problem is that the money he's calling his own is coming from his people. But just like a typical thick-head political, he arrogantly rants about how he's not tyrant like the previous ruler who imposed 60% taxes, put people to slavery, etc. To which Squire tries to knock him some sense that he did indeed put 50% taxes and force people to army, which is tyranny in itself. But Jackson Gord believes he earned this privilege to torture people just because he threw off the last tyrant king. Squire is then thrown out the room who dejectedly sighs that the king might have been a great force on battlefield, but he has zero eligibility to be a ruler. Jackson Gord angrily wonders if he should fire Squire when the doors bash open revealing a happy guy, Duke Keltron, greets with a series of sweet talk for the king. This automatically puts the king in a good mood since obviously he likes Keltron. Keltron informs him to handle some documents. The big bulky king looks at the documents for a moment like a kid who can't even read, and then nonchalantly throws the documents telling a shocked Keltron to deal with the minor duties as for him, his duty is only to protect the physically weak people. In the outskirts of Rettenzel, the three musketeers stand in front of a lousy house that Sihan bought as a base, since a long stay in a motel would cause unwanted attention for them. Zeon dramatically sighs that if he knew Sihan needed a house, he would have sold his own to buy a better house for him. The other two just ignore his antics and enter the house that looks like crap with all the dirt and trash. Zeon enters and gives the place a death stare which creeps Alida and Sihan who are right away thrown out of the house since Zeon's OCD has been triggered. For the next couple moments, Sihan and Alida hear questionable voices from the guy cleaning the house. But the house looks spotless when they enter again, amazing the two. Zeon wipes a tear seeing Sahan's impressed look, but panics on seeing a dirty spot, which earns a bored look from Sahan while Alita plots. In her mind that she can just spit on ground next time she ends up facing Zeon in a fight. Sihan grins evilly, ready to plot against Jackson Gord now that their base has been established. Zeon briefs Sihan that the six kingdoms have been divided into three categories, the strong, the average, and the weak kingdoms. The Lilstein Kingdom and the Irathius Empires are the two stronger ones. The average ones include the Saffron and Fios Kingdoms, whereas the weaker ones are the ones that have shown practically no progress in the past 10 years, these are the Jackson Gord and the Their Anti Kingdoms. But even so, the stronger kingdoms also aren't too strong in comparison to the rest of the kingdoms. Zeon further tells him that there have been conflicts between all these kingdoms too, and gives a reference to the latest Kargan War that was a conflict between the two stronger kingdoms over ruling the Kargan city, but the violent approach of the Jackson Gord king to declare a war against whoever tries to take control first. This ended up in a settlement to divide the rule over the Kargan city. Sihan processes all this and talks while they walk out that he figured they won't be on their best terms since they are rulers now, and they always have been troubled in head since they banished him. This angers Zeon who talks ill about them to kill a true hero and he shows self-remorse for serving for those rulers. Sihan just looks at him telling him he wasn't killed. Sihan enthusiastically asks an exhausted Alita how her training has been going. She nervously tries to show him her failed attempt of thousands change energy that changed her to a hideous manly face for a moment, and then it just changes back to normal face. Sihan could not control his laugh at how she looked but Alita is not amused, only pressurized about not being able to control this transformation. Sihan consoles her that she doesn't need to rush and should try to calmly have the fighting energy solidify an imaginary make, up over her face. Alita listens to him with focus and then patiently tells him that it's the third time he's given her the same explanation, and he should try explain it some other way if he can. Sihan chuckles telling her he doesn't understand it completely either, he's just phrasing how Levene explained it to him. Alita asks him to explain how he mastered it then. 
Sihan reckons it impossible which confuses both Zeon and Alita. Sihan explains that the bodies have similar properties of people from Earth and Terranor, but how they perceive magic and fighting energy, is different. These two aren't things one is born with and one has to find it in himself, which is a very hard thing for a Terranor being to do, but it's relatively much easier for an Earthling to do. A creature from any world, when crosses dimensions, their body and mind are reconstructed which is why their strength is increased. Sihan explains this is why he easily mastered these two in just three years. This impresses Zeon who has shine in his eyes for his lord Sihan while Alita is infuriated at how this is so unfair. She calls it a scam to which Sihan says he already told her he is not a prodigy of all this stuff just special. He further tells her to try and figure out this learning on her own. Upon pondering over this information, Alita throws in an interesting question that if this reconstruction theory is true that means if a being from here crosses dimensions and returns, their strengths would be affected by it. Sihan's eyes go wide at this thought and he calls it a possibility. The conversation is interrupted by a loud noise and shaking near them which alarms them questioning if it's an earthquake. But Sihan senses some energy around him that makes him doubt something he does not expect. There are some lion-like monsters named Leocan that are attacking people who are in panic trying to save themselves. Sihan saves on of the people while the three prepare to face them. The three are puzzled at the possibility of finding 30 Leocans appearing in the main city and attacking people, making them seriously question the security and regulations of the city. Sihan still deems it impossible for these monsters to appear that randomly in a city hidden by forests and does not think of it as a mere chance. Even though Sihan can attract unwanted attention with this, but he considers it a priority to fight and save the people around them which is supported by Alida and Zeon. They start fighting of the Leocans when some soldiers behind them halt them. Seeing the Jacksongord knights relieves the three that the monsters would be taken care of easier now, but the knights only order the three to stop and back off which irritates Alida, that their priority should be to hunt down the monsters first rather than stopping people trying to help save lives. The knight only gets harsher in tone telling them to back off since it's the king's orders which baffles them. Sihan suddenly feels another familiar energy around him and looks around frantically, sure that his former ally Jackson Gord is around somewhere. Jackson Gord enters with an attitude questioning arrogantly about the audacity of some lowlife beasts to try and harm his people. And he dramatically announces that he is here to save lives now. Like and subscribe to our channel for more interesting recaps like this. Jackson Guard appears asking his knights to defend the citizens while he takes care of those monsters. Jackson Gord grins thinking of defeating those lion-like beasts as a form of exercise for his body, ready to attack them. He starts fighting them off one by one with two huge axes in his hands while the citizens stand there impressed by the strength of their king. The Leo can start running away but Jackson Gord does not allow them to do that and stomps his foot on the ground instilling a battle seal around him. Zeon is shocked to see a battle seal being applied for the first time in his sight while Alita questions being foreign with the term. Zeon explains that it's a transcendent ranked sword hire's ability to use his combat energy to apply a magic seal around him. Meanwhile, he uses his hand of a giant to finish them off and win the hearts of his citizens. Alita looks at the monster-like king while Zeon nervously thinks of the powers and abilities of a transcendent ranked sword hire. Sihan just stands there unamused. Sihan figures out the scenario that all this chaos was planted here for the king to gain trust and support of his citizens. He understands this being the reason why they were stopped from fighting off the beasts, because that way the king wouldn't have been able to showcase his powers. He knows this would work for the citizens, but he is mad that Jackson Gord would stoop this low even though he used to have such a strong belief, even with his violent personality. It infuriates him to see his former ally act all arrogant and genuine while people cheer for him. That's when he connects some more shocking dots. He realizes that dumb Jackson Gord has no idea this was a planted attack. He looks at a pleasant Jackson Gord knowing that this was a show from his subordinates pleasing him while they mess with the state's affairs. Sihan stands there disappointed at all of this when Jackson Gord looks towards him with wide eyes, which scares Sihan. Jackson Gord finds him different and unusual knowing he hasn't seen that face before, but just lets it go and moves back towards his palace. Sihan ponders to himself that even with that stupidity in his head, Jackson Gord's physical abilities are still up to the mark and haven't deteriorated a single bit. 
he decides that he needs to wait and work for the right time to reveal himself to Jackson Gord instead of doing it right away. Ten days pass while the three settle in he capital and work on themselves. Alita finally starts to understand the basics of thousands, change energy and gains control to slightly change her appearance. Xeon learns about mountain-breaking art from Sihan, a fighting technique that was created by Sihan himself. Meanwhile, Sihan worked on himself to improve his magic and combat energy and managed to increase it three times to that of when he came here. While the three kept working on themselves to be better versions of themselves, the King's Knights announced that some evil pagans in Berselt have been controlling monsters to cause chaos and disturbance among citizens, so a team needs to be assembled for this expedition. The three look at the notice and Sihan questions about the pagans to which Zeon explains that it's a clan of dimensions that worships Hiris, the true god of the outside world, and even though they were subjugated by the tyrant king back then, looks like they have managed to reassemble their forces again. Sihan laughs and mocks those people to still be believers of religion but his amusement is cut short when Zeon tells that they are called the second coming of Sihan. Those people believe that Sihan was the son of Hiris and was summoned here to defeat the monster king who used to torture people. They believe Sihan wanted to take people back to his world, Earth, but before he could do that he was forcefully sent back by the six evil revolutionary heroes, his former friends, so he went back to Hiris. Sihan listens to this agitated at the half-truth and half-lie. But he lets this go and talks the two into joining the expedition since Jexengord would definitely lead it on his own, and there will be lesser guards outside the capital so they can corner him much easily. At the assembling of the team, Count Keltran introduces himself as the leader of the expedition throwing all of Sihan's master plan down the drain while Alita innocently mocks a dejected Sihan about it. Sihan thinks of the torture they'd have to go through due to the failure of their plan but then considers it an opportunity to work good enough to be in the sight of Keltran and get a chance to approach Jexengord later. But Sihan also wonders how Jexengord missed such an opportunity to involve in physical combat. Keltran, on the other hand, thinks of the pain he had to go through to convince his king to not rush into leading the expedition, and wonders what mess he's gotten himself into. Keltrin was actually asked for this expedition by Trendon of the Blue Ivory Tower. He was also asked to keep this issue a secret from Jackson Gord and deal with it using manpower other than official military. He was also offered six Magians and some Lion Knights to aid him so all he had to do was recruit a small team and lead the expedition. Keltrin accepted this offer due to the debt on his head from the Blue Ivory Tower, so he leads his team to their aim. The pagan leader, Lakran, addresses his tribe telling them that the non-believers have decided to fight against them but they need not to fear as according to their god, Hiris, it is the death that gives them true freedom. A death that's not by selfish means but for means of freeing others. He asks the ones chosen for sacrifice to step forwards and not be afraid, so three of the pagans step forward foolishly happy to sacrifice their lives. Lakran summons the dragon of Hiris to receive the devotion of those believers who fascinate over the sight of the dragon only to get literally consumed by the dragon the very next moment, as the form of some sacrifice. Lakran announces this as an accept of this sacrifice. Lucran thinks to himself that glad this trick succeeded this time too. He looks at the ashes of Heart of Lusklin blood that he owns and understands that these ashes, along with the sacrifices will make the dragon suffice to his wishes for however long he wants but he also wonders that he needs to keep the dragon to listen to him to fool the people he has coaxed into his agenda. He sadistically thinks of enjoying this till it all lasts. The expedition team camps at a spot in the forest to which Xeon worries of the disorderly state this team is in as compared to official military. He worries how they'll fight if they can't even maintain an order in simple team management. Alita listens to him and mocks him for being a high and might knight not knowing the ways of such mercenaries. Zeon listens to this and retaliates with a taunt to Alita's blue blood. They both stare murderously at each other when Sihan intervenes telling Zeon to watch his words as someone hearing those words would be dangerous and troublesome for them. Zeon panics at offending his Sihan and apologizes over it. Sihan changes the flow of conversation telling them to eat which excites Zeon to cook for his ideal savior. As Zeon prepares a stew, Sihan offers his disappointment at the redundant menu to which Alita thoughtfully starts explaining how it has got all sources of nutrients while Sihan wonders why is she even explaining all this. 
Sihan waves her off telling he just doesn't find it good outside to which Alita mentions that they're only eating to survive not for flavor. Zeon cuts them off announcing their stew is ready but to their shock, it tastes way more delicious than they expected. Zeon pleasantly explains that cooking is his hobby so he plays around with ingredients. Zeon further explains that recipes are like precious treasures to chefs and he'd be stressed whenever his palace chef would ask him for this vegetable stew recipe. They both listen to it while Alita fondly asks him for another bowl of it. Suddenly it starts raining and everyone on the team just starts rushing into their camps to avoid rain. Sihan sighs disappointed that it's harder to send stuff in rain and instead of anyone being on guard, everyone's rushing to a shade. Alita continues that the main power of that cult comes from the demons so it's safer for them as beasts avoid rain. Zeon explains that even so, someone should be on alert as controlled beasts could be forced into rain against their wills. Sihan denied this telling them that animal instincts can never be disregarded no matter what the control. Sihan confidently announces that no demon would move in this rain only to himself exclaim a nervous enemy invasion. Demons enter their campsite making Sihan wonder if things changed here in the last 10 years. The leader announces for everyone to make a circular formation for attack. One of the mercenaries attacks a demon thinking they got one only to be thrown away by it. The demons keep their stance even after being brutally injured making everyone confused on their persistence. People realize that the control demons won't back off and the only solution is killing them. Sihan orders others to start killing the demons off one by one by concentrating on one demon at a time. The mercenaries attack while the lion knights ponder over Sihan heavy a strong stance and being useful commanding the people. Amidst such a chaos while a coward Keltron just thinks of how those knights are supposed to protect him. The two keep on observing Sihan, smirking that a guy on this level could serve them very useful. Sihan and the others fight tirelessly with those demons succeeding in defeating them. Everyone exclaims joyously over defeating 44 demons while Sihan in the background wonders how all of the beasts appeared, and not a single of those tried running away. His mind cannot comprehend the possibility of magic controlling the consciousness of something to this extent that they have zero control left over themselves. He has never seen such a thing before. Sihan's eyes wander off to four Magians, discussing something very seriously making Sihan realize that this wasn't just a simple expedition, and there was definitely more to it. Sihan grins at this. Coward Keltron orders everyone to keep their guard up or they'll be punished. People badmouth him behind talking about he hid during the attack and he only knows how to talk big. They curse at how their loss would have been reduced if they lion knights and Keltron participated. Even Zeon and Alita talk about his incompetence as a leader and his selfish behavior. Sihan, while fixing his tent, tells them that he's always been like that causing both of them to turn their attention to Sihan asking if he knows Keltron from before. Sihan adds he's only heard a little about Keltron from around knowing that he's got the body of a sage and the mind of a beast. Zeon ponders over it thinking maybe Keltron isn't as useless as it seems when he clicks that Sihan's statement about his body. And mind sounds quite opposite than usual to which Sihan chuckles that he didn't mix the example and Keltron is in fact dumb. And coward yet he's always managed to somehow survive all kinds of situations around him. Sihan mocks the fact that Keltron is a count now while Alita wonders that there must be something about Keltron that he's reached such a status. Everyone is taken to Zard village where they are appreciated and told to relax for the night so their second expedition for the cult can begin the next day. Some mercenaries happily talk on how this has been the best treatment as the mercenary ever. Sihan hears the people and think on how they were badmouthing a day ago and are now happy with their leader. He compares this nature to his people back on earth when Zeon announces their beds are ready to rest on. Sihan lies on his bed exhausted as ever and ready to rest when his name is called causing him distress. Dina, the apprentice of Black Knighthood Foreman requests him to follow her since Magion Habark and Hire Jolderin are interested in seeing him and his companions. She takes them to their rest area and is about to leave when she notices Alita's age and looks up to her for being in a fighter rank. At such a young age. The three enter the room and are introduced to Habark and Jolderin who show them a map pointing out the base of the cult they are aiming at. He tells them that the beasts were under a spell that had them completely under control, to which Sion agrees, and tells it was his first time noticing the beasts not affected by rainstorm. They are impressed at some mercenaries noticing such details and they ask them if they could keep a secret to which Suhan confidently asks, for their benefit in it. 
the Magaon liking the stance offers them 10 gold coins and tells them that the cult has only been using sorcery by sacrificing human lives in order to produce this control over beasts. He explains that sorcery is an unstructured and disordered form of magic that uses blood and lives to produce their spells. Sihan questions that has the cult been using sorcery instead of magic to which Magaon denies, and starts to explain what's rather an embarrassing part for them that this spell to control beasts has been a top secret spell of the Blue Ivory Tower. He explains that a high ranked Magaon Rockran used to be a part of Blue Tower's secret and dangerous experiments due to his talent and skills, but due to his desire to work on more and more, he accidentally let loose some dangerous subject beasts that they were experimenting on receiving a four element punishment. The punishment being using fire, earth, water, and wind to execute the person. Zeon is shocked and this and calls out what kind of experiment could lead to such a sentence of execution, to which he is told to keep his words careful. Zeon suddenly panics and starts bowing in apology for crossing the line. The Magion tells them they only need to know what the job is, so listen carefully. He further explains that somehow Rockran managed to escape his cell before execution and not only that, he took a test subject along with him. A beast that has the power to put other beasts around him under its control. Sihan is shocked at this information. What they still don't know is that Rockran's parent has been a higher member of the cult that is second coming of Sihan, and the beast is being used to strengthen the cult's force. Jolderan then explains that the main motive of this subjugation is to execute that beast, and remove the traces that link it to the Blue Tower, and they could use the skills of the three to succeed in the mission they're on. Sihan fakes an excited expression acting that they're thrilled to be working with such high knights and magians, and he's sure that they together, can take down even a dragon. Habark agrees and tells him that he is right about this. The beast they're going to defeat is in fact dragon, the earth dragon. This leaves Sihan stunned and speechless. The revenge trio sits beside a pond doing their laundry while talking about the events of last night. Sihan tells them that fighting the earth dragon would be a hard job provided he's already weak on his powers. Zeon questions the need for recruiting so many hires and magians. This makes Sihan wonder if taking up the offer was a good idea which he himself counters with how they must have gotten rid of the three if they declined since they are aware of the ivory tower secret now. He also adds that they still kite try and do that after their work is done. Alida and Zeon look at him for a proper moment, making Sihan arrogantly think that the two must not have thought this thoroughly only to be proven wrong when Alida counters him saying he's wrong since Zeon must have intentionally tried pondering over the secret experiment and if their plan was killing the three they wouldn't have hidden this in the first place either. She also adds that they didn't get much into the other details either but told us enough to not consider it simple orders so they must need them. This somewhat embarrasses Sihan for underestimating both of their thinking capabilities since they both were very much aware and thoughtful during the whole scenario. Zeon then questions Sihan for his motives with this plan, to which he smiles that going with the flow might provide them with some information to approach Jexengord. Sihan and Zeon then banter about the clothes tension between them relevant to the underwear fiasco when some pleasant ladies approach them intended on their own laundry and offer them nicely to rest in the village. The two guys respectfully respond and take their leave while Alida just looks a bit reserved. Right when their backs face the women, something monstrous shines in their eyes and the women suddenly pounce to attack the three but Alida, walking in proximity, reacts with perfect timing making the guys and even those women shocked at Alita expecting something like this from such a pleasant facade and reacting with such accuracy. Three of them paced themselves to face the cult fanatics in midst of which Sihan questions how Alita figured this ambush to which she just says she didn't expect it she was just cautious as a habit whenever someone approaches her. This creates a rather funny image in the head of Sihan when he pictures an unamused blank Alita looking at the previously happy and friendly women talking and wondering what moment they'll stab her for no apparent reason. The creepy fanatic women just look at the three murderously chanting how death is their only ultimate success that they will achieve and go to heaven with. Their eyes scare Alita who exclaims to the others to be careful because of that look but literally 10 seconds later Alita and Zeon just stand behind Sihan looking at all the maniac women lying unconscious by the ultimate powerful Sung Sihan. 
Alita cheapishly says that maybe only the eyes were the different thing about them to which an unamused Sihan boringly lectures her that not everyone can be a berserker, they were some old ladies not warriors. Sihan then wonders why the three were targeted at such an area only to see clouds from chaos and fight rising from the trees. They realize that the believers have attacked the entire subjugation to which Sihan clenches his jaws in anger for leisurely doing laundry while there's such a havoc out there, they figure that the whole village has been a den for the cult while they resided in it. The village is in utter chaos and damage with fire and blood all around while the maniac believers of the cult chant about going to heaven and attack the subjugation venomously. The Magians and knights fight the people out of their minds only to be burdened by demonic beasts attacking them. The knights still don't lose their guard and keep on defeating the beasts along with wondering what kind of demonic city are they in for the trouble to just keep coming and coming to them non-stop. Magayan Habark tells the Jolderan that the heretics must have controlled all the beasts over the entire mountain range which shocks him wondering how vast the mind-controlling capability of the dragon is. But he consoles himself that this means that the dragon is at least 500 years old only to be tortured again by Habark who reveals that it's just a 100-year-old dragon with increased mind-controlling powers via experiments. Jolderan pales at the revelation that this dragon must be strong then, but this time Habark actually tells a bit reassuring fact that it's just his mind-controlling ability that's been affected more than they expected not the physical, fighting or magic powers. But this isn't as reassuring since it doesn't mean the rest of its powers are less, it's just the calculations were accurate. Their panic is cut short when they notice the beasts heading to Tavern where their mighty superior Keltron is in hiding. Keltron starts shivering, shouting and at most crying like a coward that the knights should have been guarding him and this was supposed to be a safe place when even his current guard are shaken a bit at the sight of the demons, but Sihan, Zeon and Alida appear at the perfect moment to deal with the issue at hand. Sihan is approached by the knight who gets to know that the rest of their subjugation is in ambush too. He tells Sihan to protect Count Keltron to which Keltron also cowardly orders to do so making Sihan have funny disappointed expressions at this. Suddenly, Sihan becomes hyper aware of a presence approaching his side. A presence none other than the Earth Dragon. As the Black Lion Knights manage to fight away most of the beasts, a new wave of panic occurs when everyone on the subjugation notices the Earth Dragon out on the open ready to fight them. Nobody expected to face the dragon this soon, but the knights try to calm themselves that they have a strong team of knights and magians at the moment. The magians prepare their defensive spells while being a teeny bit relieved that the dragon's physical strengths are exactly according to their calculations so they would be able to handle this with the knights. But the knights are flushed already with fighting all those beasts and worry about facing the dragon at the moment. Jolderan still worries that the dragon still has strong powers to which Habark calls it a probability of 4% that his abilities will grow further. Once again, this doesn't serve as a reassurance for Jolderan but he redeems his composure thinking it is what it is and the knights are supposed to back down so they should ready themselves to fight. All the Black Lion Knights face the dragon with their unique iron wall technique which impresses Zeon a bit while Sihan just looks at it as a picture of Jexengord's past image, but he does not see it as a strong stance rather a dumb thoughtless move that could cost them more than they expect. He observes the moves and fights thoroughly, understanding that everything about the technique is just the same as the Jexengord he knew from ten years ago. Suddenly, he realizes and smiles to the fact that then the weaknesses of Jexengord and his knights will still be the ones he knows too. Sihan then comes back to reality and the three head to face the dragon knowing that they won't win without aid. That's when a forgotten Keltron intervenes, selfishly, telling them to lead him towards the safer route since he's gonna be next after the knights which earn him many disappointed looks but it does not pay them any heed. The coward Count just keeps screaming at them absurdly while Hey try and figure out what to do with him. That's when Keltron realizes that they're gonna make him pass out and go ahead to do whatever they want. Sihan nervously tries to do so, but Keltron catches on on it and mocks them for thinking so but before they could think of any other way to get rid of Keltron, a huge weight hits his head making him pass out. Dina turns out T.I.B. getting rid if the unnecessary annoyance. 
After appreciating Dina with genuine expressions, they go ahead to aid the knights OM the fight who seem to be exhausted like hell with all the labor they went through in a single day. Not being able to hold themselves anymore, the knights try and dodge the foot of the dragon that hits hard on the ground but Knight Living bears the force OD it and is thrown away but before his flying body could reach the dragon, Alita attacks the dragon and the other two save Living. Jolderan addresses Sihan, who explains Keltran's fainting with an excuse and how they came to help along with mentioning the close save of Living's life. Jolderan appreciates Sihan at all this effort and saving their lives when he notices Alita holding her arm in pain. Sihan worriedly asks her if she's fine to which she tells him that the powers of Dragon are much more than she expected so her attack resulted in a reactive injury to her own arm. Sihan seriously tries telling everyone that they need to target the scales of the dragon first because it's hard to directly hurt the dragon with their normal attacks but his mouth suddenly hangs open with eyes wide in speechlessness when the dragon panics at Alita's blood on its face and runs away scared and something just like it wasn't a well-trained old dragon to have great powers. Everyone just stands there questioning what just happened wondering whether it was phobia of blood or something else, but they are too tired to do anything else than letting it settle for them. The attack ends there and a few of the so-called believers are held and tied to be mocked by others for using their legend's name like that, to which they still reply adamantly that Sihan Savior would save them. Sihan overhearing this just goes for a I want in his head and leaves. Alida and Sihan talk about the loss due to the ambush along with discussing that the rest of the people must have ran away by now and the dragon and Lacrin must also be in some proper hiding by now so this subjugation can be considered as a somewhat a success. Meanwhile, in a random cave Lacrin worries in exhaustion about why does the dragon not listen to him at all anymore while the dragon just lies there unbothered about the presence. Lacrin keeps trying for about four days to convince the monster to obey him and attack the rest of the subjugation, but the monster pays literally no heed to any words from Lacrin as if there's no such existence. He thinks of his evil plan of needing the dragon to attack people who are after his life ang with stealing and running away with all the money and jewelry he has taken from the stupid believers as form of their donations. Lacrin threatens the dragon to wake up and shoes him off with the traces of Lusklin blood only to receive the shock of his life that it gets the dragon's reaction but not the way he expected. Instead the powder in his hand starts burning making Lucrin throw it off and wonder what's happening. He looks at the menacing dragon with fear enough that his body already looked like the soul left it. He further is affirmed that indeed his soul is about to leave his body is when he notices that even the mind control magic has been broken and the dragon is free now. And what else would a free dragon do than eating away a person who used to control it and is being extremely annoying Ariand. So that's how the Ort with Lucran comes to an end. The especially selected part of subjugation to capture Lucran and the dragon reach the cave where the dragon resides and wonder what would be the dragon doing in there where Luke Ran would be and what are the possibilities of the controlled beasts still lurking around. In the midst of this important mission, Jolderan and Habark talk about the elephant in the room, why is Keltran accompanying them as a liability? This is when they argue on how Keltran weighed the possibility of staying back with the soldiers in a region where beasts can attack or wandering off with stronger knights to an even more dangerous place. So he obviously chose the latter to follow. And not as a joke, but Keltran actually had a proper image of weighing the two options and choosing one. Getting back on track, Habark tells them that he's affirmative that the dragon resides here as he used confession magic on the hostages to get them to tell all of the stuff to them. They mention that the normal confession magic didn't work much, but as soon as they used some unknown black powder, they succeeded in extracting of the needed information. Sihan wonders about what the pewter could be. That's when everyone feels a good sense of battle intent from the cave as they see the eyes of the dragon shine from their looking at them with literal flames and ice. Everyone gets into their battle position ready to face the dragon, but everyone was left too stunned to react as soon as they came to face the dragon out of the cave. Its size has increased much bigger than before that causes everyone to panic and worry. They all wonder how the dragon became so large just in a span of four days. 
Jeldurin grins evilly that no matter how he grew up this much or whatever the reason be, it's not a problem for him and he'll defeat the dragon to show him what kind of strong powers a BLCK Lion Knight has in itself. Similarly, Habark also remarks about how the presence of too many people and too many beasts didn't allow him to flex his magic, but now he has enough fighting energy and power and everyone else is not tired either so this time the battle can actually shift their way even if the dragon magically increased in size. Everyone uses their fighting energy and spells in a combination for the dragon such that the Magians work in a way to attack while the knights use their energy in a defensive manner. This impresses Zeon as a technique and even Sihan calls it a nice move and if it remains stable they won't even have the need to intervene in all this. But once again, another situation cuts Sihan off to leave him shocked with eyes out of his sockets yet another time. All the defensive and attacking magic is vanished right in an instant just by the looks of the dragon that completely backfired their plan. This time, the dragon looks like an otherworldly monster with no control whatsoever creating havoc all over by throwing fire from his mouth. Even Sihan feels the heat of the fire which makes him realize that his magic nullification doesn't work on this dragon either, confusing him yet again. He then notices how half the people have already been taken down and Magians are just ordinary here since the creature is resistant to magic. This is when Sihan makes a very risky decision of saving lives. Sihan risks his appearance being unveiled by displaying his fighting energy and exert it to get ready to face the dragon on his own, only for the sake of saving lives. Sihan prepares himself by exhibiting a strong aura of his fighting energy surprising every single person out there, include Alida and Zeon who did not expect Sihan to go ahead and showcase the actual talents he owns. Zeon figures it's the high-ranking aura of the savior that he only heard of in the legendary stories. The Black Lion Knights are shocked along with Alida to see Sihan's powers while Zeon just stands there impressed explaining to Alida that it's a high-ranked skill that was created to defeat Tyrant King's monsters and is way too strong as compared to other auras. Sihan proceeds with his heaven-breaking aura to attack the dragon to affect his scales but feels annoyed at the same time for not being able to use the actual power he owns. The knights realize that he's no ordinary mercenary and is even stronger than them but nobody recognizes him due to the weakness in his powers except for one person. Zeon and Alida try to aid Sihan in the fight but the tough creature doesn't allow them to intervene but this still doesn't faze Sihan who's determined to end this even if his identity is revealed. Sihan's warned about the dragon using all his powers so Sihan exhibits even more energy than before turning his heaven-breaking aura into death dragon aura to finish the dragon fighting for his life in a single blow worth thousand blows. Sihan sighs in relief, seeing the dead dragon satisfied by the execution. While the others just stand there in disbelief at an ordinary ranked mercenary killing a dangerous otherworldly creature single-handedly without getting hurt at all. Sihan looks bothered and uncomfortable at this even thought he knew everyone's gonna stare once he does something like that. He doubts of everyone identifying himself but only receives words of how everyone is amazed and impressed by what he just did. This leaves Sihan confused unable to know how to react and cover the situation up as the knights keep questioning why he's been working as an ordinary free hire with skills that he owns. Sihan figures that his weaker powers gave him the benefit of everyone just assuming it as his talent and not some unusual powers. He feels a mix of emotions at the fact that his self from 10 years ago could have dealt with such a monster in a single blow, but he lets it pass thinking that at least this expedition is over. He is interrupted by Jolderin questioning on why he's been hiding his identity and abilities since his skills don't fall behind in any way as compared to the Black Lion Knights so what's his reason behind using the mask of being an ordinary user rank? Sihan nervously thinks of an excuse when Zeon intervenes in rescue explaining how his big brother has been training in the mountains since years and is not accustomed to working as a mercenary since long so he suggested him to work as a user rank first to gain experience of living such a life. He tries to wave the situation off by explaining that it's kind of necessary for free hires to be able to hide their true identities due to the work they do. In all this rant, what the knights focus on hearing as a priority is Zeon calling Sihan an older brother while it looks quite the opposite to them. Lucky to them, 
The knights buy the story and Sihan just chuckles awkwardly agreeing along that this proved a great experience for him and he hopes he has been a help to them, and if so then he'll be happy to receive some bonus rewards for this. Jolderan smiles in comfort understanding the money-making nature of Sihan and informs that he'll be receiving his reward back in the city to which an actor Sihan reacts gratefully. Sihan genuinely thanks Zeon for covering up for him to which Zeon waves it off saying his hard work to hide the identity and adjust the strength to not reveal his true self shouldn't have been gotten caught so he did what he had to. This catches Alita's attention who discreetly whispers to Sihan on Zeon not knowing he's lost some of his strength. Sihan gives a justification that it's not an easy thing to do to share your weaknesses once you've been betrayed by all of your own close friends. He explains that he only told Alita because it was something inevitable to share with her. He further sighs in relief to Alita that he wasn't caught by the gambling move he made by using that aura in front of everyone. He says that only a super sharp-sighted person would be able spot his true self with his current energy level. Alita spots a distressed guy over the back who's been a former acquaintance to Savior Sihan and is known to have a sharp sight, getting Sihan's attention to none other than Mr. Coward Keltron. The expedition comes to an end with a few lives lost and the body of Lakran and the dragon being burned down by magic to remove traces. This makes Sihan notice on how magic works on the bodies of otherworldly creatures and they disappear to it even though it doesn't work on alive otherworldly creatures. He notices another detail that this happened to the female Ignis Wolf too, but not to the male leader. The night before the squad returns to Jexengord, Sihan faces a scared and shocked Keltron with an evil grin. If you guys are new to the channel, I got you covered with all good content like this so feel free to hit that subscribe button and join us on the road into 100,000 sub and if you guys enjoy the video or if you guys find it interesting, let me know by dropping a like on it as well would be seriously appreciated. Let's continue. Sihan knocks on Keltron's door telling him to address the elephant in the room, but a nervous Keltron feigns confusion questioning what this is about and how they should be asleep. Sihan looks confused for a moment and then exclaims to Keltron to speak up which scares Keltron enough to call Sihan, Savior Sihan. Keltron's face pales while Sihan grins evilly since he was right about Keltron figuring out his identity. Sihan sits across from Keltron impressed that he figured this out unlike the sword hires which makes Keltron confess that he has met him a few times and has seen him fight so he was able to pick up the similarities even though the power differed from before. Keltron simultaneously wonders why would a savior be in disguise if he's back. He thinks that even if it's to not be troubled or disturbed, Sihan has still been putting way too much effort for this little a reason. This makes Keltron voice out his thoughts to Sihan on whether he still has enemies in Terranor. This surprises Sihan on how easily Keltron has been putting the pieces of the puzzle together so he questions back to Keltron on why would he think so. Keltron nervously answers in honesty that there have been rumors of him being forced back to Earth by the six rulers since he left out of nowhere and even though the rumor was ignored as provided the strength of Sihan, the other six would be stupid to assume they'll be safe even after sending him back. He tells that seeing Sihan back made his mind wander back to the said rumor. Sihan scrutinizes Keltron impressively to how he figured out every detail so easily by just spotting Sihan back in a disguise. He wonders why Keltron is referred to as a beast brain when he can work his brain this well. Sihan smiles asking what would Keltron's reaction be if the rumor turns out to be the truth. Keltron analyzes the situation in his head knowing that it seems weird for it to be true, but if it is in fact the truth then Sihan is definitely back for revenge and he's only going to get rid of any hindrances in his plan. This realization makes Keltron's brain melt and his soul leave his body as he gets down on his knees in front of a bewildered Sihan pleading him to not kill him. He starts ranting about the family dependent on him who'd be on streets if he dies. Sihan looks at the situation in horror figuring out the reason of him being called a beast brain. Keltron has always been the one to succumb to fear and he only works his brain well and confident when he's sure of the situation being a safe one for him. Sihan asks a bawling Keltron to get up since he doesn't plan on killing him to which Keltron pledges his alliance to Sihan, ready to betray Jexengord. Sihan smiles confidently telling Keltron that it'll be with a cost and hits Keltron's chest with some energy while the dumb count starts panicking that he's about to die only to be told that Sihan inly used the exploding ore on him. 
Exploding Aura is a skill of Sihan to implant a bomb energy in someone's chest and cause it to explode anytime he wants, but the skill doesn't work on sword hires and magians. Sihan claims that Keltran's life is now in his hands while Keltran simply sighs in relief that he's alive. This confuses Sihan on Keltran not worrying about the aura to which Keltran easily explains that of course he'll support the savior instead of the guys who are trying to destroy them with their bad ruling and as long as he proves his loyalty, he knows Sihan won't use anything against him. Sihan leaves the place to meet Alida, who's been on a lookout for him. She asks in worry if he's feeling weak with all the fighting and the exploding aura to which Sihan sarcastically replies of using something that doesn't exist. Turns out that the exploding aura is only a rumored skill to play mentally with the opponent and instill fear in them, the skill is not even possible to exist. This somewhat offends Alida feeling like being scammed like many other people. The two walk off discussing the expedition and wondering the link between the female Ignis wolf and the dragon. Sihan thinks of the two linking back to the experiments going on in the Blue Ivory Tower. This makes Alita share one of her own confusions with Sihan. She talks about the black powder that they saw being used to control the beasts to which Sihan intervenes that it indeed was something weird and too strong to have the ability to take over someone's mental state completely. But this isn't what Alita's point of worry has been. She shares of having an eerie and ominous feeling when she saw the powder being used, something so strange that she couldn't describe it other than having dozens of bugs crawling up her body. She speaks, almost distraught, that the moment she saw the powder, it made her want to cry. Lilstein uses the black powder to control another being and tells him to kill himself which the guy begins to comply to but starts gaining his sanity a bit last moment to falter and be aware of what he's been doing. Lilstein is annoyed by the fact that no matter how much heart powder he uses, he can't control anyone enough to make them kill themselves so he simple burns the person with magic. He keeps wondering how he can achieve perfect mind control. Meanwhile, Keltran briefs Jexengard about the events of the subjugation and how the real aim was to target a dragon that has been living there for about 300 years. He briefs Jexengard about the injuries and the events leaving out the detail linking to the Blue Ivory Tower. He tells that the dragon's identity was kept a secret by the cult taking the blame of the events that occurred due to the dragon. This infuriates Jexengord, who's always eager to fight that he should have been the one to be gone on the subjugation since it would have been thrilling for him to have faced and taken down the dragon. Keltran apologizes nervously, but Jexengord lets it go knowing that Keltran was unaware of the existence of the dragon. The two captains from Black Lion Knights discuss about the people who made great contribution in the subjugation, interested in knowing them and recruiting them as Black Knights, but the three have already joined Keltran's knightage which kind of annoys them, but they let it go considering them the people not worthy of being knights since they went for a job with more money and less work. Keltran meets with Sihan in his mansion and briefs him about saying whatever he was told to say and using their fake identities to recruit them as his knights for an annex building that is a bit isolated from notice. Sihan listens to all this with a satisfaction and jokes about the only task being left is them getting on their knees to pledge an oath to Keltran. This successfully triggers Keltran as his face loses its color and his jaw drops at this. Keltran panics that this humble behavior of such an esteemed personality for him almost gives him a heart attack every time. Keltran then nervously pries on when is he planning on killing Jexengord if he's here for a revenge which makes Sihan laugh out loud at the thought of killing someone just for betraying him. He tells Keltran that he has no motive of killing anyone since they sent him back alive and unharmed too, and they just lost all of affection and care of Sihan for them which is not worth killing. Sihan speaks darkly that he won't be killing them, fully showing that he has something evil up his sleeve. A flashback of a battlefield from the tyrant's rule shows a saffron sitting by fire in deepest of thoughts when Jexengord approaches him asking him to go celebrate their victory. Saffron speaks that this victory doesn't entirely belong to them entirely and this fight was against the half-brother of the tyrant leader and they didn't win because of their fight but because the triant king himself had his brother's army backstab him and get his brother killed. Jexengord takes it all as a joke of the beheaded brother looking furious at his backstabbing king brother and he understands that bloodline does not matter in politics and it's just winning that matters. 
Saffron smiles at how simple the thinking mechanism of Jackson Gord is and envies him for it alongside asking him to think of who'd be the leader if they succeed in killing the tyrant. All Jackson Gord thinks about it how it'll be peaceful to have that environment, but he adds that it'll probably be Sihan. Saffron proceeds to out a thought in Jackson Gord's head that would they even remain forever friends with Sihan, provided they just witnessed a brother's betrayal a while back. Jackson Gord wakes up on his training ground realizing that he dreamt of a memory from such a long time ago and thinks of the decision they made, but he's violently interrupted by someone trying to get into the middle of his training even though he specifically told the guard S to not be disturbed. A long-haired guy, named Ains, enters and questions Jackson Gord for starting a construction for another palace next to an already existing concubine palace. He calls it a waste of money and useless torture of making people work as laborers. Jackson Gord's great reasoning for a whole new palace is just because he doesn't like the heating system of the concubine palace and desires a fancier place. Ains gets even more infuriated at this useless labor for his citizens and exclaims that it sounds like something the tyrant king would have done, but is violently cut off by Jackson Gord for crossing a line there. An angry Jackson Gord, with red in his eyes, sternly tells Ains that this statement is crossing all boundaries even though he is a family. His son. Singord yells at a trembling Ains to dare repeat the words that just came out of his mouth. Even though hesitating, Ains decides to purr his heart out by calling Jackson Gord, out on treating the citizens like the Lusklin King as they're having a hard time keeping up with the load Jackson Gord is putting on them. He talks about how rebels and cults are forming again due to this insensitive behavior. This infuriates Jackson Gord to the extent of exploding who screams at Ains of not knowing anything about the Tyrant King to be comparing that to him and asks him to leave. Ains leaves his sight satisfied to have at least spoken out his thoughts. Jackson Gord sounds annoyed and disappointed thinking about how weak his son is and how less of strength and aura he has. He thinks of how all of his family was executed by the tyrant when he was labeled as a traitor, and it was after their success in the battle when he came back home that he realized his son was alive. But now instead of being happily with him, he's embarrassed about Ains not having any potential skills to even be a sword hire. He's physically weak and an emotional person which is total opposite of what Jackson Gord himself is like. Jackson Gord thinks to himself that it may ebb because he spoiled his son too much. The Keltran mansion has a very ordinary-looking building in it that Keltran gave to Suhan to live in. But turns out, it is still very lavish on the inside. Sihan questions of such a building existing so perfectly as if it's been ready since years. Keltran shyly responds to this with a crazy-sounding ideology. He explains that he's not been married so he specifically got this building made if a lady of his interest appears. This obviously sounds like Keltran planning on kidnapping the woman he falls for and keeping her here which is called out by Sihan as a crime. Keltran nervously blushes and further explains that it's not for kidnapping but keeping his potential family safe, and in hiding from all of the dangers that befall him as a treacherous retainer. The three are more puzzled than amused by Keltran's thinking as they know he isn't in as much danger as he thinks, and it's too much detail for someone who isn't even close to getting married yet. Nevertheless, the topic of conversation changes to Zeon happily exclaiming on selling the house they were previously living in on a better prize, and getting more money for it. Sihan is happy that they now have enough money for a while, to which Keltran panics telling them they don't need to worry about money anymore, since he's happily there for Sihan's support every way possible. In a private conversation outside, Sihan thanks Alida for suggesting keeping a boundary between himself and Keltran as it's better to limit their relation. Alida counts it as a relief as having a boundary and proper attitude between people makes them conscious about their position, while providing too much comfort can lead to them considering you as an equal and losing the respect and entitlement you have, especially for a personality like Keltran's. Sihan takes her words in with focus alongside wondering about so much of Alida's concern in this. He gets a vague answer to his confusion, resulting in an even more confusing state but Alita turns the flow of conversation to asking if Zeon and she should also start talking formally to him. Sihan, not impressed by this thought, asks her not to unless it gets absolutely necessary since he seems to be liking the casual friendly relation with the two. Alita's also glad at this. Sihan then tells her the reason for calling her outside being asking her if she wants to learn magic since he thinks she has more potential in it provided her background as she did in fact indirectly summon him. 
Alita is surprised at the sudden offer and isn't really sure if it's a good idea even though she knows it'll be nice to have skills in both aura and magic. Her main concern is the fact that she can't learn magic from the people of the Four Towers due to her having the Lusklin bloodline. Sihan chuckles I this questioning why she would need to go there when the most high-ranking Magion is right in front of her offering her. Sihan was originally a ninth-floor master-ranked Magion along with being a godly-ranked sword hire. If you guys are new to the channel, I got you covered with all good content like this so feel free to hit that subscribe button and join us on the road into greater heights. And if you guys enjoy the video or if you guys find it interesting, let me know by dropping a like on it as well would be seriously appreciated. Let's continue. He starts off with her briefing about the basics of magic. Magic is used in three different languages. The rune language contains word to only move magic. Second language is the spells that create magic, like the magic fire. And the initiating words are the third that actually cast the magic. Sihan demonstrates the three, startling Alita who didn't expect him to throw magic fire so casually. Sihan then says these are only the basics as if it's not big deal but Alita just observes him tensed about learning it all. Sihan further explains that mastering these basics is the actual time-consuming part and once she's done with it, she'll be able to learn the rest fast. Sihan explains the complexity and extensiveness of magic. That it's impossible to learn it all no matter how smart one is so all Magians use this secret spell book that contains a magian's wisdom and information. It's person-specific, created by every Magion when they learn magic. Alita is bewildered upon seeing it for the first time even though she's been around Magions. Sihan explains that it's kept invisible since it contains all of the knowledge a Magion possesses. He shows her the posture a Magion attains when surfing through the book which she finds familiar. Sihan recalls how it was easy for him to take SATs on Earth due to this book, which once again leaves Alita blank because what even is SATs for her? She pries about magic not existing on Earth, which Sihan replies in positive. She further pitches in her thought that since he was able to use it there means Earth isn't rejecting magic. Sihan also gets curious since he never thought of it that way before. He gets into a thought that he was only able to acquire it since he crossed dimensions. And maybe that's why the rest of the earthlings don't know about it. Alita answers in excitement that then there won't be any single person even close to competition with his skills and powers. This startles Sihan who didn't know Alita had any interest knowing about the earth. Alita then questions Sihan about his days when he went back on earth only to be surprised by the traumatic expressions that Sihan's face covers after hearing her. The shameful flashback of him landing back on earth naked on a busy road hits him. Sihan recalls how everyone remembered him everywhere as the guy who was found naked on a street. His lost state of mind was taken to be a drinking problem by the police and his troubled childhood and bad grades were used against him to call him being missing for three years as him running away. The policeman investigating him tried to get answers out of him hut was stopped by Sihan using magic against him and getting out of the issue. Sihan left the station only to be greeted by his angry father. In their apartment, his father keeps yelling at him questioning where he's been and not contacting him. He further mocks him for not even completing middle school and being viral as the naked guy. Sihan sighs exasperated, thinking how his father didn't even feel a tiny bit emotional on seeing his missing saw man jump straight to insults. He realizes that he never missed his family in Terranor and neither did his family miss him. The father further orders him to go back to Seoul, complete his high school, get into a college and study like his life depends on it. Sihan, tired of all this, just agrees to it and walks away to a still ranting father about either do all this and be a decent person or go missing again. While walking away, Sihan feels angry and humiliated at being banished after doing so much and settles on going back to get a revenge. Sihan then locked himself in his room for a year, pretending to study but actually working on his magic abilities and knowledge on Terranor to be able to get back and then easily cheat on his exams using his spell book and getting into a prestigious university. His father praised him for finally getting on track to which he just calls him out on doing what he was asked to and that now he'll just live independently. His father mocks him on thinking it's that easy to live on your own and looking down on world. Sihan, on the other hand, actually looks down on the world due to the skills he has by the mercy of an unexpected trip to a certain world. 
Sihan uses his spells to get his way into earning money and earns enough in a year to live his entire life easily. But Sihan still worries about not being able to find proper directions into getting back to Terranor. He feels like he's floating into a black hole, with no directions to know where exactly would Terranor be so even with being able to crossing dimensions, he'd not know which dimension leads him to the place he wants to go to. He starts to feel weak in his determination thinking whether all this is worth getting back on them since at least they didn't kill him. He started feeling like he should forgive them since they didn't do something worse with him, and he felt like understanding why they do that to him. He lost hope in being able to get back. Compromising with reality, Sahan started living a normal life in his college. He then went to the mandatory Korean military service. That experience, funnily enough, got him rid of his nightmares about Terranor. Instead, they were replaced by nightmares about going back to the army again. Even with good enough skills to help the world, he never felt motivated about it provided his past experience. He kept living a usual life but inside, it felt dark and dull to him. Until one random day in gym, he suddenly felt a similar energy inside of him. It baffled him to feel something so familiar until he recognized it as the magic from Terranor. He started to mindlessly run towards the traces he felt connecting to Terranor. Unaware of the reason for his own excitement, he just kept moving towards the location mark, overjoyed by the hope of being able to get back to Terranor. Sihan recalls trying everything to go back to Terranor but finding it impossible, but this location mark gave him hope and excitement, in his dull life. But due to these traces, he realizes that it was foolish to think to himself, that he forgave them when in reality it was only him giving up and finding a way back. He never forgave the people who took everything away from him which is why he didn't feel any peace in living a life on Earth. Quitting college, he starts studying about dimensions and returning to Terranor again, this time adamant on not giving up and getting his revenge. Even though he knew it was a tiring time-consuming job, he kept working more and more only to finally succeed in connecting the paths between Earth and Terranor. A tired, dull-looking Sahan regains all his energy back at the successful results of his hard work ready to snatch everything away from the people he trusted the most. Coming back out of the memories of the past 10 years, Sihan summarizes it to Alita as spending an ordinary life back on Earth with ease due to his powers. He considers it needless to brief Alita about all the bad stuff. Alita just smiles shyly to this information confusing Sihan with her behavior. Alita sits trying to focus on her mana when Sihan asks, interested, if she feels anything to which Alita replies about feeling it very slightly. He tells her that the most basic and first step is to feel the mana and then go on to learning the magic. He further encourages her to do her and try to reach the third floor rank as that rank magic is what helps hide the traces of dimensional summoning magic. Alita is shocked at this being only third rank magic once again surprising Sahan who replies in positive, since he was able to do that even with being low on his powers since it's actually erasing or adjusting the traces that require a higher rank and not hiding the traces. Alita nervously listens to Sihan. Sihan then gives her the news that he thought would be good for Alita, that she would be free from following him everywhere if she learns this skill. But instead of being happy about it, Alita panics that she can leave after this. A baffled Sihan nicely says that he can't hold her freedom and wishes her to live a quiet peaceful life like before but Alita has other plans. She questions whether she can stay with him and be of any help if she wishes to do so. Even though confused, Sahan nevertheless tells her that it'll be nice to have a trusted person in his support if she wills. Alita then gets into a deep thought and questions if Sahan would stay here and settle down once done with his revenge like he planned 10 years ago. But Sihan tells her he is only back for revenge and Terranor has lost the importance and affection he had for it before, so he'll just go back once he's done and has a closure. Alita questions again that doesn't he need to burn someone's heart for that which causes Sihan to panic and respond of never doing that, and going back the same way he came. He elaborates that going back is easier for him since he belongs to Earth so once he opens the dimensional gate, it'll naturally guide him towards Earth without need of a location mark unlike when coming here. His face turns dark thinking that the only problem would be not knowing exactly where he'd land but he exclaims of already preparing a returning magic to not give another strip show to Koreans. And of course by now Alita also realizes how deep Sihan's trauma about that is. 
Alita then softly smiles requesting Sihan to stay by his side and be able to go to Earth with her since with her cursed bloodline she can only have a future in another world. She offers helping Sihan in his revenge and requests in turn to accompany Sihan to Earth. In the Jexengord's kingdom palace, Ains notices his stepmother, Queen Layla, taking a walk outside without maids and smiles at her telling her it's dangerous. She returns it with a painful smile explaining that her status as a queen is just being a showpiece with no worth to her position, that could have her in danger. She talks about how the scenario would have been different even if she received the king's love but she's only his wife for his political benefits, so she has no danger to worry about. Ains re zero lies that it's true that his father has no interest in her and then adds something jaw-dropping. He hugs her from behind telling her it's a relief that the king has no interest in her because he does. She tells him that someone can see them together but he is affirmative of no one being around to witness his compromising relationship with his stepmother. Ains is later walking down the halls when he tells someone to come out of their hiding with a bored expression, to reveal none other than Mr. Keltron, who has a dark smile on his face briefing Ains of having good piece of information for him. Sihan, Zion, and Alita enjoy having an ample amount of pills that help increase their fighting energy. It's an expensive pill like protein powder for muscles but for fighting energy, that the three were only able to have such freely because of Keltron's resources. It helps Sihan in regaining his energy enough to the master rank along with helping Alita feel better about hers. Sihan thinks about how this rate of regaining his energy can help him face Jackson Gord much sooner. Some maids usher Sihan into Keltron's office who explodes on Sihan for being so late on arrival and not obeying him right away. But as soon as the maids leave, he falls on his knees bowing and welcoming Sihan. Sihan, amused by all this, sarcastically praises Keltrin's acting skills making it seem all so natural. They then get to the point where Keltrin, upon Sihan's request, looked for potential people who could go against Jackson Gord and are not happy with his rule. He prepared a list of those with power enough to support them. Keltrin discusses how he's sure everyone will support Sihan over Jackson Gord anytime, but his appearance in public would mean the other kings knowing about him and his revenge and having potential time to face Sihan and obviously all of them facing Sihan would be hard to deal with. Keltrin then expresses his great idea of bringing down Jackson Gord's rule by having all of the citizens against him, to which Sihan kind of laughs at the irony of this coming from someone who was just recently Jackson Gord's strongest ally. Sihan still wonders that the backlash for Jackson Gord still isn't as strong as he expected it to be which means Jackson Gord also still would have considerable support due to being a revolutionary hero. Keltrin explains how Jackson Gord rules over the Black Lion Knights directly which is why they are in Stro support and loyalty to him, with an army around 30,000. Sihan recalls the events of the expedition, thinking to himself that there may be some knights who don't exactly worship Jackson Gord. Keltrin then mentions the aristocrats who are loyal and have the core authority to the administration. Sihan is interested in this one and asks about the center person of this since it should be attacked first. Keltrin just raises his hand that it's him. They then talk about the best fit option to turn over the kingdom's rule, to which Keltrin agrees, but shares a concern about that person treating him like trash and really hating him. None other than Ains. Keltrin's visit to Ains makes Ains even more infuriated upon Keltrin's words of talking about betraying his father, since he can't believe someone obsessively loyal to his father would talk about such a thing. Keltrin thinks to himself that he'd never have thought of this idea if it weren't for Sihan but he obviously cannot disclose that to Ains. Ains calls Keltrin a parasite asking him to get to the point. The good with words, Keltrin agrees to Ains that he indeed is a parasite but the one who knows how to choose a good host and he believes that Jackson Gord's rule is already coming to its end. Ains warns Keltrin of not thinking about this as a joke. Keltrin darkly says that it's not patriotism or the tortured citizens he cares about, his concern is having his own luxury and benefits retained. The reduction of suffering of the citizens would just be an added benefit to this. Ains questions why Keltrin thinks his father's rule is to be short-lived, to which Keltrin makes Ains realize that he's the weakest of the six kings and one wrong or weak move and either Lilstein or Inatius Empire would betray him and take over just like they tried during the Kagan War. He emphasizes that there's no friendship left between the heroes of world, and the kingdom won't last if Jackson Gord doesn't step down. Leaving Ains in thoughts, Keltrin laughs to himself in mind thinking of how he already knew that and planned on selling the nation out and running away, 
but by the courtesy of Sihan, he now has gotten the role of a patriot that's also serving better than before for him than his plan of being a traitor. Ains comes out of his thought and questions. What does Keltran think of gaining from all this since he's very much aware of Ains' disgust for him so it's very likely that he'll snatch all of Keltran's luxury and status from him. Keltran calmly responds to this with a pause, telling the prince that he is a tool for the king. If the king wants loyalty and proper rule for the kingdom, he'll support it but he'll still support the king if he wants to be selfish and tyrant. He'll simply follow whatever the king wills like a robot, with no mind of its own. He gets serious with his words telling Ains that Jex and Gord wanted greed and tyranny from him, and he got it and whatever Ains will want from him, he'll do it too. So what is it that Ains would request him of? Ains is super annoyed at Keltran for his words sure make sense to him. Keltran then gets up to leave after completing his agenda. While walking away, Keltran lightly mentions of Layla being a queen, the king's wife. This hits Ains right in the nerve who questions what Keltran is implying. Keltran turns with a sly smile, mentioning that only the person with the title of the king can claim the queen. In Keltran's palace, Sihan is relaxing while reading a book, thinking of the day as nice and peaceful when a sudden scream startles him. Moving towards Alida and Zeon, a panicked Alida questions Sihan on what should she do, referring to an injured, passed out Zeon. If you guys are new to the channel, I got you covered with all good content like this so feel free to hit that subscribe button and join us on the road into greater heights. And if you guys enjoy the video or if you guys find it interesting, let me know by dropping a like on it as well which would be seriously appreciated. Let's continue. Sihan shakes an unconscious Zeon to get a grip on himself questioning what's wrong with him when Alida nervously starts explaining the incident. Zeon was happily engrossed in his plants while Alida was analyzing her strengths and practices. Finally feeling a bit ready to try some stage 1 spells like creating magic fire. She used her now created spell book to read the spell, starting to feel fire around her fingertips but her excitement was short-lived till she realized that the fire she's created is not controllable to her. Trying to divert it, the fire started directing at Zeon and in trying to save him she changed the fire's direction. But that resulted in the death of Zeon's true love next to Sihan, the crops he harvested. Hence why, Zeon wasn't actually hurt but just passed out due to the shock of losing his plants. Sihan just listens to it all with dead expressions, not knowing what to say of it while Zeon wakes up and whines holding the remains of his plants about how it should have been him and not the plants. Alida apologizes innocently and promises to hurt him instead of the plants next time, to which a troubled Sihan exclaims, to direct it in the air please. Sihan then notices the marks after the magic and realizes that they don't seem like coming from something of a first-floor magic, and requests her to cast the spell again. Even before her completing it, Sihan tells her to stop with a stunned look. He's dumbfound by observing her energy to be around someone who's capable of eighth-floor magic level. Listening to this, a shocked Zeon exclaims how I this even possible for a rookie but thoughtful Sihan responds, that innate talent for magic is not something that could be logically explained. A flustered Alita interjects, confused about what's going on. Sihan then explains that magic energy is absorbed from the nature, and if a normal magician absorbs like 10 units of energy, the transformation loss leaves only one or two units for them to actually use as magic, but in her case, the transformation is amplifying the energy instead of losing units resulting in her not being able to control the intensity. Sihan seems troubled thinking about how he didn't know this fact, but is Lilstein or Sagran aware? Alida panics asking if she'll have trouble learning magic now and in response Sihan makes her more shocked, suggesting her to stop learning for the time being since the amount of magic she possesses makes it way riskier to cast the spells she knows. Alida, however, denies this telling him his reasoning is logical but he told her she's got strong magic skills so she shouldn't be wasting them and instead, should work on them to be of help for Sihan. On seeing Alita's determination, Sihan hesitantly mentions that there could be a way for him to help her since being a human, he also had an abundance of power and he had a hard time learning how to control it. This gets Alita excited and hopeful at this when Sihan suggests that he could teach her but he's unaware of the risks, involving the training so she can agree if she's fine with it. And of course Alita agreed to this without the slightest of hesitation. Sihan enters the palace back with an enthusiastic Keltran welcoming him back. Sihan sets himself in front of Keltran and questions about Prince Ain's response to the offer. 
Keltran updates Sihan of Ains finally showing interest in their plan after a couple of meetings, but he demands a strong proof to convince him of Keltran's ability and determination to succeed in this plan. Sihan smirks, expecting Ains to ask for something like that and inquires Keltran of what proof he wanted. Keltran replies Ains asked him to eliminate one of the three loyal dogs of Jexengord. This gets Sihan confused. Keltran explains that the three controllers of military, economy, and political sector are the most loyal subordinates of Jexengord who rule people behind him. They are referred to as dogs in hopes to be put down one day. The Black Lion leader, Berkeley, is the military leader. Jexengard's father-in-law is the economy leader, Duke Chromaton. Sihan, amused by all this, asks about the third loyal dog and guess who it is, Keltran himself. Ains asked Keltran to get rid of higher Berkeley. Sihan is doubtful in having to deal with a master-level sword higher since it's easier for him in his normal state, but he can't use his usually ways of fighting to remain in hiding so it'll be a bit troublesome. Sihan thoughtfully says he needs to know more about this higher in order to do so to which Keltran amusedly replies he might already know enough. This baffles Sihan who doesn't know any Berkeley but Keltran explains that he changed name after the revolution but Sihan must remember. Jacksonguard's first assault commander Adarth Wald, leaving Sihan in thoughts. Berkeley's army, on the other hand, is seen to be harassing the laborers into making them work endlessly. For the castle only for some laborers to be fed up of being tortured and scared by killings of their fellows so they start a riot. The news reaches Berkeley who is also told that some of the former knights from Jacksonguard's revolutionary army have been a part of the slaves and those are the ones fighting. To this information, the arrogant Berkeley blames them for losing their prides and gets set to DEA with the issue on his own. The leader of the riot turns out to be one of the master-ranked sword hires from Jacksongord's revolutionary army of back then, Captain DeLarth. DeRolf kept fighting along with requesting some of the knights who were his former allies to back off, not wanting to fight them. That's when Berkeley enters the picture, mocking DeRolf of being a traitor and committing treason by showing disloyalty to their king. The old man is pissed at this knowing that the tortured people deserve freedom from such oppression, but this is not a big deal for Berkeley. It's just a direct order of his king that matters to him. Instead, what irks Berkeley is the fact that DeRolf keeps calling him Darth Wald, the name he left behind with his history and how he's been living with a name that was apparently given to him by the king, as a form of honor and loyalty by his service. DeRolf mocks his former ally in one last try asking him if this is the world they wanted and fought so hard for. But that infuriated Berkeley even more and hit his patience so he brings out his sword taking a hit at DeRolf. DeRolf defends that one hit by his own sword but realizes that even though they both have the same fighting rank, Berkeley's energy is far more stronger than his so he can't long last against him. In a few more hits, Berkeley injures DeRolf enough to have him down unable to fight anymore to which his supporters shout and show remorse to Berkeley for doing that to their leader. An unbothered Berkeley tilts towards them identifying some of them as his former allies and calls them foolish for pulling such a stunt. Considering himself a lion, he portrays them as rats in front of him and announced to his knights that he's taken care of the leader, so they can take care of the rest of the unnecessary chaos, punishing the rest of the traitors. There's a bloodbath of the former sword hires of the revolutionary army while Berkeley mocks an injured, near to death, Deralth for this stupid act. He tells him he could have ran away and saved himself if he were alone, but instead he pulled out an entire squad for this rendezvous. He looks down on DeRolf for sacrificing his life and dignity for some lowlifes, which earns him a laugh from a weak DeRolf. The half conscious man fires him back, questioning if he calls what he does loyalty, for Berkeley's always been killing people. He was a murderer in the past and will remain so forever. It obviously hits a nerve, but Berkeley again uses the excuse of not liking being called by his old name and kills DeRolf, just like the murderer he was accused of being. DeRolf's words further proved out to be true when Berkeley's knights informed him of killing off the sword hires and taking the citizens as hostage, but the violent Berkeley darkly labeled them as traitors too, and ordered to finish them off too surprising even his own knights with that command. That's when Prince Ains entered the picture, with Sihan silently following interjecting at the right moment, not permitting what Berkeley just commanded. Berkeley clenches his teeth, obviously not fond of Prince Ains. Prince Ains orders him to stop the massacre as a successor of the king, but Berkeley carefully mentions that he's got the right to order his knights, but Ains logically explained that if all those laborers are killed then who'd be building the king's new castle, so even if he wants to punish, 
he should at least wait till the construction is complete. Prince Ains reluctantly agrees and mocks a sweet agreement to the prince. Ains leaves unamused while Berkeley talks behind his back calling him too soft to be Jackson Gord's son. Ains talks to a his silent company, Sihan, about how a former revolutionary hero is now, but Sihan sighs saying Berkeley's always been like that, killing anyone who gets in his way. Ains mentions how his statement seems to be hinting Sihan knowing Berkeley from before, but Sihan hurriedly covers it up with calling them Keltran's words. Ains interrogates Sihan on how he got involved in this stuff, to which he replies of also thinking of Ains a.a. a better suited king as compared to his father. Ains feels a bit disappointed at hearing such a compliment for the first me and refers to being called a dog in comparison to his father being a lion. Sihan tries to uplift his spirit by calling dog a loyal, trustful and better company and a man's best friend, which obviously turns out to sound a bit odd for encouragement but still Ains understands the point and feels good about Sihan and thinks of building trust for him. Sihan while leaving thinks of how his revenge would disrupt peace of the present but thanks to Jackson Gord's pathetic rule, he doesn't feel bad about doing what he's planning. He mentally thanks Jackson Gord for clearing his mind of second thoughts. Lion Lieutenants sits in a dinner place for food and drinks, laughing and enjoying, unbothered about the commoners glaring at them with distaste. Berkeley offers everyone drinks and then tauntingly asks if they hear about what happened at the construction site. The rest of the table is unaware, so he explains that Prince Ains requested better residents and better supplies for the laborers working there. The arrogant lieutenants are almost furious as in their might sights, the laborers don't deserve those privileges and their captain should have interjected. Berkeley smiles with evil proud expressions that of course he didn't support this provided the recent attempt of revolution, and how these luxuries could make the laborers attempt more of their rebellion. The others, portraying their sick mentality, support Berkeley calling those poor people lowly and undeserving of peace and rest. They all laugh their sick laughs at this supposedly amusing conversation when suddenly an arrow comes aiming right at Berkeley's forehead, from the narrow gap between the doors of the place. All the others are alarmed and worries about their captain, asking him to dodge it fast or it could hurt him but Berkeley just uses some of his energy and lets the arrow hit his forehead, and break into two. The lieutenants are amused and in an awe for their captain's energy. Berkeley is impressed by whoever did this since the arrow was aimed accurately from such a narrow gap, and its tip had a good amount of fighting energy to it. The sick captain is excited to go out and see who had the audacity to pull off such a stun at him. The lieutenants march outside in the heavy fog that makes it hard for them to see around but when their vision finally adapts to the clouded atmosphere, they notice Sihan and Zeon standing right there glaring at them in quite a funny way rather than intimidating. Berkeley recognizes them as people from the expedition and questions that it can't be Keltran who asked them to do it since he's the definition of coward. He inquires whether they are doing it on Ains' commands. Sihan hits back telling him to think of it however he wants since he won't be getting away from here alive anyway. He openly threatens to kill him right there. Berkeley, on the other hand, is amused at the audacity of who he considers a stupid kid since there's no chance the two can fight the might lion lieutenants. The lieutenants charge at the two while Berkeley nonchalantly tells them to not kill the two so they can question their aims later, but is kind of surprised that Sihan's confidence indeed matches his actions as he's able to defend himself against his lieutenants. Sihan and Zion confidently fight back the lieutenants dodging their attacks, but Berkeley announces that they need more manpower to capture these traitors alive so more lieutenants charge at them surrounding the two. The cornered Zeon questions don't they have any honor to be fighting unfairly by using four people against two. One of the lieutenants mock back questioning Zeon's audacity to be questioning honor when he just attempted their captain's assassination. Zeon suddenly guilty agrees to the lieutenant's words when Sahan shouts why even Ryu agreeing to them, to Zeon. The lieutenants form an iron wall around them using their shields surrounding them in a way they can't escape, but one of the lieutenants decides they should attack two in order to capture them. Sihan smiles at this decision expecting them to do such a thing but much to everyone's surprise, the two just start running away calling it not their day. The lieutenants, not wanting them to get away, chase them sure that they'll be able to catch them easily. Zeon is amazed at how the lieutenants are running Sith such heavy shields on them as if they're nothing. The two then suddenly jump off a bridge but that route is blocked which makes the lieutenants mock them for being trapped. Berkeley taunts at them for not having a proper escape plan when they wanted to attempt such acts. 
he mocks them for having better chance of survival if they simply jumped off of a building, and that they should have tried to be more careful when trying a murder attempt. Sihan sighs dramatically exclaiming that they might have been way too careful instead since they didn't have to do much. That's when Alita appears in everyone's sight, which everyone again questions since they only know her as someone from the fighter rank. All the lieutenants are busy laughing at the absurdity of the situation when Berkeley is shocked at the amount of energy. He suddenly feels around her which is certainly not fighting energy. Sihan had told Alita that if she can't control her skills on beginner's magic, she should just shift to learning advanced magic since that only requires making use of her magic energy levels. Alita suddenly showers them with an arcane blast of burning bright light charging at all of the lieutenants. If you are new to the channel, I got you covered with all good content like this so feel free to hit that subscribe button and join us on the road to greatness. And if you enjoy the video or if you found it interesting, let me know by dropping a like and comment on it as well which would be seriously appreciated. Let's continue. Alita herself is shocked at the amount of strength her spell had but she suddenly stumbles and falls back feeling exhausted. Sihan consoles her that her weakness is understandable since she used all of her magical energy in this spell. He tells her that it's gonna take some time for her energy to rebuild and she won't be able to use it for the time being. He jokes that it's like her daily wage as a laborer magaon. Sihan is very amused at his joke while Alita just weakly questions what even into this. Zeon on the other hand is dumbfounded on the great magic she pulled off as. There's not even a single trace of any of the lieutenants left around. He is impressed that they were able to get rid of Berkeley this easily. Sihan explains that their iron walls weren't this strong since they don't diminish or distribute the force that befalls them but just take it. And of course there was a certain amount of force those walls could take and that certain amount was certainly less than what Alita's spell had. Sihan confidently announces that no sword hire can take that much amount of force with just an iron wall, but his words are cut short, when his eyes go wide in surprise on seeing none other than Berkeley, appearing around them extremely furious with not even a single scratch on him from the recent attack. The three are stunned to see Berkeley safe and sound in front of them. Sihan tells Alita to stay back and decides that he'll hide behind Zeon's attacks so that he doesn't have to show much of his skills, and have his identity hidden since if he shows his true fighting energy, Jackson Gord with his great skills can identify his energy later from the battlefield's traces. Sihan talks about Berkeley being an expert in spearmanship but right now he's holding a sword, and he may now have been obsessed with using a sword after being a Black Lion Knight captain but no amount of training can prove advantageous to him in comparison to his expertise of spearmanship. Sihan shows confidence on winning if Berkeley only uses sword. Berkeley mocks Sihan on his thought process and calls it too less to be something to count on. He calls Sihan ignorant and shows his skills and energy to be able to use his cape as a spear for fighting shocking the three in the process. He looks down on Sihan for thinking Berkeley would not be prepared with a weapon all the time. Berkeley shows his anger and determination to torture the three by displaying his great energy around him. Sihan is struck at the sight as he not for once thought of the possibility of Berkeley learning Jackson Gord's explosive art. He is pissed at himself for being an idiot on underestimating Berkeley on having a weapon and on improving his skills by learning some special art of Jackson Gord. Sihan thinks about the situation for a brief moment and calmly asks Zeon to back out of this fight as he's only going to turn out to be a liability in this situation. Zeon, although bewildered, just does as he's told. Sihan gets serious to face the situation now, knowing this can't be handled with subtlety. Berkeley charges at him but Sihan manages to dodge it, although impressed a bit Berkeley is still sure that he'll be able to defeat who he thinks is a coward. Explosive art is something that uses offense and defense at the same time so Sihan knows that his mountain-breaking art cannot counter it ideally. He knows some of his techniques can serve dangerous for him so he decides to use the one for face-to-face -face battles. He extrudes his tremendous fighting energy he owns which stuns Berkeley for a moment but he composes himself, knowing that the guy must be of some master rank himself even though he looks so young. Deciding to avoid danger by underestimating Sihan, Berkeley decides to put an end to the situation once and for all instead of playing around and torturing Sihan. He uses his most powerful attack of explosive art on Sihan but Sihan just stands there unbothered and unamused having easily counterattacked the shattering attack by his own torrent attack of Tyrant King Art. Berkeley clenches his teeth in annoyance and frustration on Sihan defending the attack he put his whole energy into. Before Berkeley could openly point out the fighting technique Sihan is using, 
Sihan effortlessly cuts off an arm of his leaving him on ground in panic and pain and every shocked and unbelievable expression that one could have on losing his arm. Berkeley hisses at Sihan for using Tyrant King art so effortlessly at such a young age. He misunderstands him to be a descendant of mercenary King Barak. Sihan himself is confused at the misunderstanding until he recalls that the technique was created by King Barak, and he can see where Berkeley is coming from by thinking of him as some successor of that king. Sihan darkly mentions that it will not be a problem to let Berkeley believe in that misconception, but since the two have been comrades once so he feels like Berkeley deserves to know who's going to kill him. Berkeley, infuriated at this, proceeds to call it bullshit but his words are left stuck in his throat when the person in front of him removes his thousands transformation and reveals his true self. He is left in dismay since Sung Sihan standing in front of him. Berkeley loses the coherence of his words on seeing his former assault captain, Sung Sihan, in front of him. Sihan calls Berkeley out for all of his brutalities, which are totally against what they fought so hard for ten years ago. Berkeley stammers calling it all Jackson Gord's commands and nothing of his own. Sihan laughs at the irony of Berkeley putting all the blame on Jackson Gord and calls it very unknightly of him since he knows Berkeley was always so violent and a murderer. Berkeley panics calling himself too low to be called a knight and exclaims that he'll be abandoning his title right at this instant and proceeds to speak low of himself but Sihan puts an end to this conversation by slashing his sword through his neck. Alida and Zion stand there coldly while Sihan talks to a dead Berkeley of being here for a revenge too, but he'd never make a deal with someone who's on of the worst humans. The capital city is left in a chaos after the captain and four lieutenants of the Black Lion squad are found as tragic corpses. The next day, Jackson Gord is furious at the information and orders his people to find the criminal right away and he'll deal with him himself. On the other hand, Keltron asked Prince Ains if this was up to his satisfaction to which he gets a positive response from the prince, but he also mentions the number of people looking for them now to which Keltron butters him up by making up that his leadership can have them undefeated no matter what. Prince Ains, still not liking Keltron, mocks him for looking like a coward no matter what he says when a maid interrupts them informing Keltron of his said guests arriving. Keltron tells Ains it's the people who he thinks will participate in their agenda. Hire Jordan and Hire Ravel are two of the new appointments of Black Lion lieutenants who are surprised at their new posts, and that they were personally called to Keltron's mansion to get their appreciation from him. They think it's because they worked together in the subjugation. They both are left short of words at what Keltron suggests to them. They cannot comprehend something like that coming from Keltron, but Keltron patiently calls them its duty as a knight, to save the people from a failing king. The two cannot believe this and proceed to call it disloyalty, but Keltron tells them they're free to reject the offer and go tell this to Jackson Gord. But he also reminds them of the probability of Jackson Gord believing their words and their loyalty with the kingdom when they received 300 gold coins each for the subjugation. Ravel is infuriated at being threatened and called out like that and takes out his sword to attack Keltron, but another attack drops the sword from him surprising the two lieutenants. Someone from behind them nonchalantly calls out the unfair attitude of the Blue Ivory Tower for giving them such heavy amount, while he only received 10 gold coins. They're perplexed at seeing Sihan do that and question his audacity of pointing his sword at the Black Lion lieutenants while his own status is just that of a protector of a count's family. Sihan sighs at the pathetic obsession of nobles of thinking of everyone as a spastard and rebellion for questioning them. He asks them both to calm down with a smile, along with showing them his fighting aura. The two are jolted away by the pressure of his energy and connect the dots realizing it indeed was Sihan who killed Berkeley. But this time they call him in a formal tone rather than demeaning one making Sihan laugh at this, and call them opportunists for changing their tone with him in an instant. Keltron casually calls it human nature but Sihan is offended at this making Keltron stammer a bit and correct himself. This stuns the two even more and they are baffled at the authority of the guy capable of controlling Keltron so they question who exactly Sihan is. Sihan confidently calls himself the successor of King Barak. Flashback to Sihan bursting into Keltron's office and expressing his great idea of using this name as his identity. He explains to Keltron that he got this idea from Berkeley's misunderstanding and that he can justify his powers that way. Keltron also enthusiastically shows him all the paperwork ready already proving his identity of being a successor of Barak, since he expected Sihan to go into that direction. 
Sihan is heavily impressed while Keltron acknowledges himself as the best in forging stuff and scamming others. Higher Jordan believes it to be the reason of his strength, but he refuses to let go his honor and dignity for this disloyalty. Keltron calmly interjects saying how it would be disloyalty if this act is showing loyalty to the true king. Jordan's face contorts to confusion at this when someone from the background asks them of needing their strength for the future of the kingdom. The sight of Prince Ains asking them of this stuff is another big shock for them in the past couple of minutes leaving them all panicked and troubled when Ains calmly asks them if they'll support him for the sake of the people. Subscribe to watch more videos like these, turn on notifications, and leave a like and comment to help the channel out. Thank you for watching and see you on the next part.